Hello, vampires, werewolves, mikes, and bellas, to another one of those ridiculously long video essays about a property that you may or may not actually care about. In this one, we're going to be talking about that infamous franchise known as Twilight, and of course its entire spin-off media that has been added over the years. Now, thankfully, there is nowhere near as much stuff in this, so this should be a little shorter than previous videos I might have made, but there are just as many issues and weird things that deserve some kind of critique or analysis, or just a comment by me so that I can feel like I'm not alone in thinking about it anymore. But this brings us to the big point that you need to ask when starting a video essay, which is, what is the question that I'm hoping to answer about this piece of culture that I've brought up? Every good video essay has a core question, and while that question may go down a twisted and tangent-filled road to get to whatever answer you find yourself at, it's still essential that you have that initial driving concept in your head. With Twilight, I think the only question that would do it justice is what the hell was going on with us in the late 2000s and early 2010s that a person's Christian monster fetish was able to become a dominant force in media, so popular that it also spawned a fan fiction series that also blew up that we're totally not going to talk about because, god, I just don't think YouTube would let me. And the only real way to get the answer to that question is I think by truly understanding the franchise, by also answering the question of what the hell is going on in Twilight. Not to sound too up myself, but you know, this is a video essay and I call myself a video essayist, so I'm pretty sure that ship has well and truly sailed. But I think that we can see reflections of ourselves in the media that we consumed, and so what the hell was going on with us is also tied up in what the hell is going on in Twilight, and also, who the hell is Stephanie Meyer? And who the hell was reading stuff like Midnight Sun and Twilight Reimagined? Oh, and also, most of this information is heavily reliant on the official guide written by Meyer, so yes, it is all canon. So yeah, I think I've established the opening to this video as much as anyone could, but before we can move on to discussing the entire vampire franchise, first, we need to talk about the sponsor for this video. Atlas VPN. Now, as I'm sure you can tell from the kind of videos that I release, I love to watch all kinds of TV shows and movies to get inspiration for what I'm going to talk about, and unfortunately, I happen to live in one of the worst countries in the world for actually getting access to watch those things, as New Zealand Netflix is brutal at the best. Atlas VPN offers the ability for me to set my region as anywhere in the world so I can finally watch those programs like JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Golden Wind without engaging in hazardous torrenting. Alongside that, it also offers protection from ads and malware, lets you keep your search history private so you don't have to worry about Facebook stealing all your data again, includes a process to finding the best deals online when you are shopping around, and it offers all of this on unlimited devices based from one single subscription. Grab the big deal, because now Atlas VPN Premium is just $1.83 per month plus 3 months extra, and with a 30 day money back guarantee, protect your privacy and get many benefits of Atlas VPN for that ridiculously low price. You can get this deal by clicking the link in the video description below, but be quick, as it's a limited time offer. And if you desperately want to get the Twilight films or grab some book PDFs so that you can keep up with this video, then Atlas VPN is a pretty solid way of going about that. Remember, that's the big deal for Atlas VPN Premium at only $1.83 per month plus 3 months extra with a 30 day money back guarantee that you can only get from the link below and it's a limited time offer so if you want it, I'd do it pretty quickly. Now, with the sponsorship gods appeased and hopefully back to the restful slumber, we can finally jump right into our first topic. Who the hell is Bella? Now, a lesser video essay would assume that you haven't watched or read or absorbed information about Twilight to the degree that I need to actively describe the entire plot summary of the franchise to you so that you can keep up with what I'm talking about here, 
but I'm going to make the bold decision of acting as if you are aware of the general narrative that we're going to be discussing. Obviously, I'm going to reference it throughout, and I'll provide details and information to back up the statements that I make, but I'm not going to provide a service that you could just as well get from reading the Wikipedia plot tab. While that would let me pad the time of this video, and I did try to write it, it was just kinda boring. And if I'm bored of what I am writing, there is no way in hell you are gonna get excited about it. So let's just skip straight to the juicy, red, bloody character that is Bella Swan, the center of the world in this franchise and person by which we the audience relate to everything else and interpret the twisted underworld of supernatural creatures and uncomfortable and probably definitely 100% racist versions of indigenous American culture and spirituality. Bella is an interesting lens by which to connect with, because she really doesn't have a lot going on, a big part of which is due to the nature of her character as a blank slate by which the audience can imprint their own identity onto, or the author can pretend is herself if that is the kind of thing that she might be into. This is not an uncommon concept, especially in either classical hero tales or in teenage fiction, and if anything, Twilight really spawned a spree of empty protagonists in dangerous situations who are inexplicably what the plot revolves around. Stuff like, honestly, name a single young adult film from around 2008 to 2016 and just insert that here. Though by no means was it the progenitor of such an idea. I can't find an exact reference to the first person to apply this concept to popular culture and media, but it obviously has its roots in ideas around human psychology and theories built upon the notion of tabula rasa by John Locke, which is just a wanky Latin way of saying blank slate, that argues that all human knowledge is gained from experience and perception of it, and that we are born without built-in ideas and understandings of the world. Not gonna get into any of that, but Bella is definitely a character who meets the generally applied media studies concept of that philosophical argument wherein the characters are devoid of significant characteristics and strong emotional or jarring elements that might make it difficult for the audience to perceive themselves within the character's place. Bella doesn't ever really express herself that strongly throughout the books and films, except for in relation to the actions of others that impact her. Being a relatively passive and responsive character, rather than a driving force behind the narrative. But is that a bad thing? Is it a bad thing that Bella is this blank slate? A lot of people have certainly taken offence to these characters existing, many writers' blogs advocating for the death of this literary device because it's seen as cheap or lazy or basic. And people certainly have not been lax on mocking Bella for being such a character. Although I will say that the mockery has more often been used to apply to Kristen Stewart's version of the character within the film rather than the book. A fact that I think is mostly just because it's much more visible when someone is written like that, when we have to see a person doing their best to act it out. Possibly a little unfair, and I mean I don't think any actor was able to really perform well in the Twilight films from the source material, except for maybe Ashley Green as Alice. She seemed to do pretty well, or at the very least, it was the least wooden slash horrifying or downright mad of the dramatizations that we got. This doesn't help us answer the question that I just posed though, and in my own personal opinion, the only opinion that I'm legally allowed to give in this video essay, it isn't always appropriate to dismiss these shorthand conventions that are used by writers to convey characters or to engage the audience because it isn't always necessary to do the writing things that are constantly pushed by literary geniuses or professors or the people who write books about writing elements such as The Hero's Journey or Ronald Knox's Ten Commandments of Detective Fiction. They can be useful ways to better understand narrative choices and to better consider the way that you write and how that comes across to your audience, but sometimes the basic and simple ways to trick the audience into relating to your character is a solid method too. Especially if you are writing a simple story for teenagers to get hooked on. Bella, and Twilight by association, worked as a way in which to appeal to the main demographic that were going to be interested in the novel and film, and it did so incredibly successfully. But all of this is well and truly subjective stuff, 
dependent upon what exactly you are looking for in a character, and the problem with subjective stuff is that there is a certain point when you run out of things to say about it. Which is now. And this brings us to the far more interesting things to talk about with Bella, beyond just whether she is a good or bad protagonist character. Stuff like, why did the books and the films open with two different interpretations of her? Seriously, I don't think anybody else has talked about this, and it's been bugging me through the entire process of researching this character. In the novel, we get a reference to a future scene, wherein Bella has effectively chosen to give herself to this bad guy vampire, who I want to say is named James. I just checked it, and he is named James, so score one for my ability to remember boring, bland, white dude C from this franchise. We don't know all those details yet, of course, but it tells us some things about what to expect, and also what the character is like. We know that death has become a very imminent threat for Bella, and that the move to Forks has been a cause for her thinking more and more about the concept of death, an unusual thing for a teenage girl to really be faced with so intensely as of real consequence. And we know that she is trying to justify this death, saying that surely it was a good way to die, in the place of someone else, someone I loved. That ought to count for something. There is a cause behind this, driven by the desire to protect others, and that she is making the decision to face that consequence head on. And this isn't even tied into the frankly disturbing romance plotline that we will talk about at some point in this chapter, or at least we will talk about it from the perspective of Bella's character. Because she is doing this for her mother, who she thinks has been captured and is threatened by James. And we get the sense that she accepts the decision she has made here, that she understands the danger present, and in spite of that, is still here, and is still standing opposite this hunter, this predator, who absolutely will kill her. Devoid of everything else that happens, this is actually a really interesting preface to a book, and I think it does counteract a lot of the arguments around Bella not being interesting, or being a character who merely exists to fawn over Edward and get bounced around between other people's machinations. Because she is making a choice here. Admittedly a choice influenced by James and his fake captivity of her mother, but she is going directly against the intentions of her protectors who wanted to stay far away and safe by going straight into the lion's den. It is a decision that she has made, and while she is not strong enough to physically fight and beat the villain of this narrative, I think getting caught up in the idea that strength is only represented in the masculine concepts of it that we have become accustomed to, is a missed opportunity to see the strength that this character is showing here. Choosing the life of someone you love over yourself, attempting to save your mother who is endangered by a world that you've become involved in, is a form of power in itself. While there are certainly many, many critiques against Bella as a good feminist protagonist or an empowering figure, this preface and the scene it references does for a brief moment go against that more general characterization. Now the film, the film is a different story. While it does still feature a monologue by Bella about the same scene that is from the book, it also cuts a lot of the more interesting reflections that Bella states, and it doesn't visually reference the scene. The book clearly establishes the location as being the same, while the film is instead the voiceover, with the footage being that of the Washington forest with a deer running through it before it gets taken out by some figure and fading into white, and then into the even more white of Bella Swan. Not a joke either, they describe her in the script as having alabaster skin, and that is fucking white. Now obviously, I am a media studies nerd, and I absolutely am going to read more heavily into stuff because I'm a fucking dweeb. But this scene seems to suck a lot of the choice concept out of this intro to the character. It literally removes that word and concept from the monologue, but by drawing this allegory between the deer that we see and the character of Bella, it establishes a different initial interpretation of her. We see her as more vulnerable, prey, on an inevitable crash course of the natural order of getting murdered by a carnivore. And this deer metaphor is really iconic. It has become intertwined with the character because, of course, it's the first impression that we get, and first impressions of characters count towards a hell of a lot. 
but it's weird because it really does change the tone of the preface quite a bit. It takes away a lot of the independence that we get a feeling from from the books. It reduces Bella towards that one-note character who tabula rasas her way through the plot, and it has no reference to anything in the book. Seriously, I thought I was losing it because I could have sworn that surely at some point someone compared Bella to a deer, but I could only find two references to deer in the entire Twilight book, both times the vampires talking about how they hunted them as a source of non-human blood. It was never used as a thematic tool, and it seems interesting that the films would go to making it the default view on Bella. But we can't spend the entire time talking about the first 30 seconds of the book, because otherwise we're going to be here all day, and I promised myself this was going to be a shorter video. So I want to move on to the next important Bella thing, which is of course the romance between her and Edward. This is, of course, one of the main anti-feminist things that gets brought up by articles or think pieces, is the way that the character is built around this sudden obsession with a romantic lead who enters her life, who is dark and mysterious, and who she would do anything for, even literally endangering her own life to get just a glimpse of in the second book slash film. While, yeah, that certainly isn't a great role model for young women, I don't know if it's meant to be a role model as much as a representation of what it can feel like for teenagers. I mean, a clear, direct inspiration for the romance, in a way that almost every romance involving teenagers is inspired by it, is Romeo and Juliet, the love-lorn, star-crossed couple who struggle through the adversity of belonging to different factions who are normally at odds. In this case, rather than rival houses, it's their position in the natural order as prey and predator. And in a similar way to the Romeo and Juliet inspiration, the extremity of the romantic feeling for one another is blown up to a vast proportion, mostly because when you are in a period of time where hormones are raging and love is something that you've not experienced before, that kind of emotion can be quite overwhelming. It's a commonly mocked thing in teen drama that it replicates the attitude of the characters to overfocus on these honestly pretty low stakes flings or crushes between each other. That's not coming from nowhere. Those kind of things are generally turned into a big deal in high school, when there are not many other concerns and where social status and interpersonal relationships like that do take the fall for developing brains and identities. Basically, I mean teenagers are pretty strung out and it seems weird for us to judge the character against our own perspectives rather than the audience she is meant to appeal to. Now, while this does somewhat explain and understand some of the more often derided elements of Bella as a character, like when she keeps throwing herself into extreme danger to get a vision of Edward in the second book slash film, or when she sat around moping for months in her bedroom in the second book slash film, honestly, Actually, a lot of this stuff was mostly just present in the second entry in the series now that I'm thinking about it, but yet again, while that can be understood as representing a 17-year-old at least in the first book, and an 18-year-old for the rest of them, none of this can really excuse the creepiness of the whole romantic relationship. Now, this cannot be used as a judgement on any of the other human characters. They don't really know a lot of the circumstances involved here with regards to the age gap and the, you know, mental development stage of the people involved, and I would personally hope that if they did, her dad would say something about it. Although Bella's dad is honestly, while a guy just trying to do his best, he is failing miserably at it, especially in the fourth book where Charlie just sort of gives up on trying to keep on top of everything. You know, let's do a Charlie mini chapter at some point during this so we can get back on track with Bella here, because the age gap between Bella and Edward is fucking weird. It's slightly leaned into in the books and films, with mostly it being used as a way of emphasising how lonely Edward has been for a long time. The dude is 100 years old and never found a mate in all that time, but finally with Bella, he had that connection. And isn't that just so romantic? Not really, because what it does illustrate is the difference in experience between the two characters. Edward has lived six or so times as much as Bella has, has seen so much more and done so much more, and she is a 17-year-old. Sure, he is pretending to be a 17-year-old boy when the first book is happening, but that's not an excuse. 
This is one of the more covered elements of Twilight, and I know I'm not breaking any new ground here, but not at least mentioning it feels like a failing on any attempt to interpret these characters, and this franchise, because that creepiness in the portrayal is not just evident through the literal age gap, it's also evident through the way that they interact, and the characters are positioned opposite one another. See, one of the common things that is related in the writing between Bella and Edward is an element of vulnerability and weakness, heavily slanted towards Bella. This is present in both the themes, the narrative, and the actual wording that is used itself, all building towards giving us this impression that Bella is imminently breakable, and that Edward's strength could shatter her if he isn't careful. I mean, we all saw what happened during those sex scenes when he fucking busted up that bed, and also left her bruised by being incapable of holding back so well during the... orgasming, I guess. That was not a fun sentence. But the important thing here is understanding the way that this is used to give us, the audience, a way of viewing their relationship as one of not just mental unequals, thanks to that massive age gap, but also of physical unequals in an extremity. Edward could accidentally kill her at any moment, which is used to add a flair of danger to the romance, an air of menace and fear that I suppose makes it more exciting, but it's also very unhealthy. You should not be worried that the person you are in love with could kill you at any moment, and not just because they are a predator who has to hold back from sucking you dry, but because if they, like, accidentally high-five you too hard or hug you too tightly, they could rip your arm off or crush your organs. It's the little things, and it does sort of build to making sense of why Bella so desperately wants to become a vampire. Becoming a vampire would give her the ability to feel as if she is on an equal playing field to Edward, that she is able to protect herself and to protect him, rather than this seeming like a one-sided relationship built around Edward and his vampire family always having to cancel all their plans to focus on just keeping her alive. Like in the first one to protect her from James, or the second one to protect her from Sword of Jasper and Victoria is like hinted at, and in the third one they definitely need to protect her from Victoria this time, and also maybe from Jacob, a guy who needs to calm the fuck down with pressuring a woman who has expressed multiple times that she is not going to be with him to make out with him and to consider him as more of an option. No, no, we have to save the love triangle conversation for after we are done with this one. I'm not tangenting myself into that mess right now. And that mention of the second book slash film is actually quite a good one for illustrating that strength issue. Because when me and my flatmates were re-watching the whole quadrilogy, we thought it was hilarious how Bella gave herself, like, a pretty minor paper cut, and the response to that from Edward was to use his strength to fucking throw her across the room into a glass table. Like, holy shit, what a decision that was, of course, atrociously stupid and made her bleed even more, making the situation with Jasper, like, 50 times worse. But that does showcase the power dynamic here. Bella is kinda useless, and needs others to protect her, and can't stop them when their protection seems like it's just doing more damage. All of this, her being protected, of course vanishes with Breaking Dawn when she finally becomes a vampire, And she is then the one doing the protecting of her family and her baby, and using the mental force field power she has to keep them safe. We will talk about the powers later in the vampire section, because I do want to get into how Stephanie Meyer kinda made them like X-Men for a little bit to really excite the last battle that happened in the series. It's just such an interesting design choice with vampires, But all this conversation here is trying to get at is that the creepiness of the Bella-Edward romantic relationship is multi-layered, and it is interesting that nobody really expresses much concern with it outside of, like, Edward himself, and he is only really worried that he might accidentally kill her or corrupt her. Oh, and Jacob, I suppose pose, but we all know his real concern is just that he wants to get his dick wet and is mad that the Coldstone man is beating his ass on that front. 
There is a direct comparison that I always make in my brain when considering this romance, and it's one that is surprisingly apt because it shares a lot of similarities, and that is with the Buffy-Angel relationship from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. See, in that series we get a romance that has the similar build-up between the characters, the intrigue and mystery of trying to figure out who this mysterious stranger, Angel, is, and then finding out that he is a tortured vampire soul who, well, literally has his soul back, so is aware of all the evil he did and is trying to avoid doing it again. And that Buffy and Angel are much the same with their star-crossed lovers trope, being from two separate houses who do not normally get along, and having to deal with the consequences of that. The houses this time being Slayer and Vampire, where Buffy is kind of... They're both sort of predators, because... Vampires hunt humans, of course, and the Slayer is a human, sort of. But the Slayer is also, like, a superhuman who hunts vampires. So they're both... It... It's like... It works, okay? They also have another massive fucking age difference, with Buffy being 16 to 17 and Angel being, like, 400 years old or some shit. There are some differences between the two relationships, though, and they are key differences that are sort of interesting. Firstly, as I mentioned, Buffy is not prey like Bella. Buffy is a slayer, a person who is the nightmare of monsters, capable of killing them and more than their equal in the physical sense. If anything, based on the series, Angel might be more in danger of her in the physical sense. In fact, we see that Buffy totally kills him and beats him in a fight after he spends half a season fucking with her emotionally after his soul is taken away because he had a moment of pure happiness thanks to them having sex when she turned 17. Yeah, it's all still very creepy. Let's never forget that, Joss Whedon, you fucking weirdo. But it does remove that weakness dynamic that is omnipresent in Twilight for about 90% of its narrative. The second difference is that there is no happy ending here, where the romance pans out at the end. Angel and Buffy, or Bangle, or and Guffy, it doesn't end well. Or at least, it doesn't end in a way that we get to say, curtains closed on the romance, they all get to go home and ride off into the sunset. Angel leaves because they just can't be together and they both kind of agree with Spike's observation of the romance as being something that would kill them if they kept doing it. Spike is another vampire and a much more complex love interest for Buffy, and is in no way honestly comparable to Twilight, which is why they brought him up, but it's also very fucked up, and yet again, a lot of story stuff, what the hell, Joss? What, what was going on with the whole, um, you know attempted sexual assault scene. Pretty fucked up. Pretty fucked up. But while there is still very much the same description of this romance as being intense and the strongest love between the two characters, Buffy and Angel have so many recognised problems that it really just can't end in a positive way. And the mistrust and the inability to truly be together due to the lives they lead is represented in the series and the comics. There's a whole bunch of stuff about the comics, obviously, they end in a... not so much positive light, but it ends in a, like, a... things might work out this time kind of situation at, at the very last Buffy comic, but I bring all this up not because I secretly want to make a video about Buffy the Vampire Slayer, although I do, but because it is the closest comparable relationship for us to view Twilight through and it gives us an ability to consider the portrayal in regards to its contemporaries. And it does give us this knowledge that people are at least trying to subvert the classical trope of young women and vampires that cropped up a lot in the original vampiric stories as a representation of the vampire's role as corruptors of youth and purity, which is what young women represented by virtue of their position as virgins. I'm not saying I like any of this, I'm merely saying this is what the themes of the stories are, and how they use characters to emphasise those themes. And in Twilight and in Buffy, we do see that both of them lose their virginity to their respective vampires, 
normally what happens is they get turned into a vampire fraud by the vampire who is normally Dracula. But yet again, this is trying to mess with that repetitive narrative and change things up, so obviously that doesn't happen. Although Buffy does have Dracula turn up at a later point and he's all like seductive and stuff and we're not doing a Buffy video. And it's not shown to be this corruption as much as an advancement of love with these good vampires who are not corrupters because of their nature. If anything, in a subversion of that trope, Buffy sleeping with Angel re-corrupted him by virtue of lifting the curse and stealing his soul again. While in Twilight, it's just the necessary step to bring in the next plot point of the creepy fucking weird-ass baby, which sort of corrupts the entire film franchise by making it the only thing you can think of when you think of that film. But I don't think that's intentional. The problem with the subversion of this trope in Twilight is that the position of the woman has not changed. And if anything, we do still feel as if Bella is roped into the vampire world and corrupted by this notion that she needs to die and become one rather than live as a human. Meanwhile, in Buffy, as we mentioned, she is stronger as a slayer than any vampire, and she never wants to turn into one, instead seeking a way of turning Angel back into a mortal, which never happens except for that one episode from the Angel show. I guess all I'm trying to say is that both relationships have the creepy age gap, but the dichotomy between the partners is different in regards to the other factors and to the themes that they end up showcasing. And that's why I think Buffy comes off as far more of a feminist role model or a feminist icon than Bella does, where people think that Bella is just another submissive woman who has to abide by the strong man and has to do whatever she can to make sure she doesn't get, you know, brutally murdered by him. Whereas Buffy is the dangerous one in that relationship from pure physical strength. One subverts, one doesn't. Anyway... That's enough about all that romance crap. Let's talk about more romance crap, but this time with different people. As depressing as it is to say, most of Bella's personality is defined by the people that she is interested in or who are interested in her. And like most romances, it does drive the plot. So let's talk about the other guys. The other characters who never really had a shot compared to Edward, and it's honestly actually sort of strange that it even turned into this team-based thing, because Team Jacob and Team Mike never stood a chance, and at no point did it even remotely seem like Bella liked them as much as Edward. So Jacob, Jacob, Jacob. Jacob's got abs now. Game changer. Archie got hot. He's got abs now. And with saying that, I have now accurately described 50% of Jacob's personality in the films and 33% of Jacob's personality in the books, because he really hasn't got much going for him. Look, I know it's Twilight, every character has like one trait that defines everything about them, and that just makes it easier to write it as a writer and easier to consume it as an audience, but come on. See, Jacob in the films acts to effectively be a counterance to Edward by telling Bella how terrible he is and how stupid she is and that she should be with Jacob instead, hoping to be the rebound guy and then, like, pressuring her with blackmail into kissing him. Not a great dude, but he is a little bit more palatable in the books, where he has another identity been a member of the Quill Ute tribe, and used to relay information about the Cold Ones to Bella, something that she mostly uses fake Google for in the films. It isn't much of a role, and it might feel like how little he is in the first book slash film is sort of strange that he ends up becoming such a big part of this Team Edward, Team Jacob dichotomy later on. That's because he was never meant to actually be that. According to the official website, Maya had only planned to have Jacob just be a spouter of lore for Bella, and nothing else, but ended up changing him to become part of this love triangle and the future horrifying stuff around in printing that we will get into with the werewolf chapter, because this one is all about Bella and her romance connections, not her freaky baby. 
And as I have mentioned already, Jacob really never stood a chance, or felt like it was even close to a real love triangle. If Bella and Jacob had a book to sort of be together and then Edward came back at the end, maybe. But instead, the second one was Bella giving up sort of briefly and then maybe almost becoming a thing before she got a glimpse of Edward in her almost dying visions and then it spiralled in New Moon back to Edward obsession again. I never really understood the people who thought this was some kind of competition, or the people who seriously believed that there was a good choice here, because honestly, Bella should ditch both of these guys. They both suck in different ways. And this issue of Jacob never truly having a chance ends up turning him into a massive jealous prick in the narrative who comes off with huge incel vibes throughout the entire thing doing whatever it takes to try and ruin the relationship, no matter how much of a terrible friend it makes him in the process, turning in Bella's bike in the hopes it gets her grounded, forcibly kissing Bella, sleeping with her in a sleeping bag and making a big deal out of how only he can keep her warm, telling Bella that he will kill himself if she won't be with him so that she kisses him again, and then being surprised that Edward wasn't mad about that, and then Finally, finally, he agrees to stop trying to break them up. Though he is still a real shithead about it, right up until he sees Renezme and realises that he was in love with Bella's future child instead the whole time. I really don't know how you're supposed to root for him, and I think it's only really possible because Edward also kinda isn't that great either. Although, at least Edward doesn't act so childish all the damn time, although yet again, that probably has something to do with him being 100 years old, and we are back around to the creepy factor. Like, Jacob sucks, but he is a child lashing out, and comparing him to an ancient-ass grandpa is probably unfair. So, let's move on to the real hero of the romantic pairings in Twilight, the representative of humanity in this series, Mike. From... So, what, what do you think? About what? Do you want to go? To prom? <laughs> this is, of course, a joke. Mike was like a perennial meme for our watch party, and we all said how we were Team Mike and cheered every time that he came on screen, but honestly, Mike had less of a shot than Jacob, and he was the kind of main love triangle guy in the first book slash film. An element of Bella's characterization within the first film slash book is as the outside girl who has turned up in this small town and disturbed the balance of social circles by enticing all the guys with her mysteriousness, something that Stephanie Meyer specifically wrote in and said that she experienced herself when she was younger because, look, Bella is clearly a stand-in for the author, and some people might even suggest that she's a Mary Sue, though I would argue that Bella doesn't have enough of anything to be a Mary Sue. Like, sure, she seems to be able to muddle her way through stuff, but doesn't really feel like it's any sort of success or capability on her part. Regardless, Mike represents the human guy who is into Bella and who attempts to get with her to zero avail, failing to even get a single little kissy kiss or moment which continues to showcase how Edward really has no competition except for his own inability to be a good partner. But is there more to Mike? Is there something else to this character who is basically up there with Bella's parents as a representative of humanity to counteract the supernatural mystique and violence of the werewolves and vampires? <sighs> no, not really. He basically moves into a forlorn admirer position, existing to merely lend credence to the idea that Bella is a desirable person for all, and to cement in our mind as an audience why Bella would seek out other partners if all she has to look out for in humanity is the milk toast bland guys like Mike. We're talking about a man who not only vomits at the bloody scenes in an action film that he either agreed to go to in the books to try and compete with Jacob, or that he himself arranged for some fucking reason in the films. Like, 
I get that it's to show how much more masculine Jacob is, and Jacob even, like, threatens to fight him or beat the shit out of him in the films, which is just some more stuff that we will do our best to get into in the Jacob chapter, because we need a much more open view of how they're represented to get this aggressive streak that Stephanie Meyer wrote in. Mike is a damp rag, a barely existing character who continues to fawn after Bella when he could get with Anna Kendrick instead, a person who legitimately seems more interesting and she barely gets any screen time or speaking moments. Humanity gets a bad rap in the Twilight franchise, and it feels like a missed opportunity to really give Bella a serious challenge to her devotion towards becoming a vampire. Being human is consistently shown to be kinda shit, and the representatives of it are boring or barely existing as plot devices to emphasise the coolness of the Cullens. But so far, all we have talked about with Bella is her relation to us as an audience and her relation to other characters. We're still talking about her in a way that emphasises more than anything that big flaw that I said wasn't necessarily true that she is a blank slate with nothing going for her, who is primarily here as a vehicle for us to experience other people and the world around her, than to get understanding of her perspective and her ideas. And maybe now 6,000 words deep in, we should try to get a better handle on what defines Bella throughout the series, what characteristics she brings to the table, and what she does for the narrative. To do this, we're going to go book by book, film by film, and we're not going to mention a single one of them boys, or at least we're going to try not to mention one of them. I know, crazy thought, but let's try and see what she is like removed from the defining relations that haunt every attempt to think of Bella Swan. Because this is the best way to figure out exactly how she is meant to speak to us what kind of role model she is meant to be setting for all those young teenage women who are deliberately being targeted with her simplified and obsessive interpretation of romantic relationship and interpersonal connection. We've got to figure this one out so we can move on from Bella and finally declare her a good or bad character. Hint, it's never that simple. Good or bad is a kind of redundant subjective thing. I can say she's a good character and be right. I can say she's a bad character and be right. It... Whatever. So, in the first Twilight, aptly called just Twilight, because, yeah, that makes sense, we already discussed the way that Bella sacrifices herself as a key character moment, protecting her mum by putting her own life on the line as part of an almost declaration of independent activity from the interference of outsiders telling her what she should do, and babysitting her like a child. But what does that action lead to is a fantastic deconstruction of that one moment of real shining choice. Because we find out that the people were right to babysit her, and that she is kinda stupid and naive. The Cullens were correct in their leaping to keep her from the sadistic and evil vampires who turned up during that wacky baseball game that happened, and that we will talk about, hopefully, I promise, and that she was tricked by her desire to sacrifice herself to save others for nothing. The intentions behind that choice are still Bella's, of course, but ultimately it leads nowhere, as she just gets messed up and almost turned by James, only to be saved by the Cullens and Edward, who not only kill the vampire, but keep her human as well. And why was Bella hunted in the first place by James? Was it because of some interesting element unique to her? No, no, it's just because Edward was so into her and protective of her, and that drew James in with curiosity. She owns none of this arc, none of the last half of the original book or film, and so we must look a little earlier to find our traits and character. But in the first half, we still don't really get a lot of stuff that separates the character from their romantic entanglements, and their existence as fodder for other people's story arcs. And this is where I start to see the big issue with Bella. I defended her as someone whose existence as a tabula rasa was a simple and speedy tool for ensuring that an audience could self-insert themselves into her place because she had no real traits that would cause people to disconnect from imagining that. 
But what it also ends up doing is creating a character who is completely unrelatable, and that makes you feel like anybody else would serve as a better protagonist. Seriously, is Bella smart because she hunts down the information to find out that they are vampires when nobody else does? Not really. Edward basically reveals himself by stopping that truck, and she then either asks Jacob who tells her everything in the books, or looks it up on fake Google for like a small montage that seems like it takes one day, and that's it. I mean, she basically charges Edward with that basic ass bitch information, and Edward just goes, yeah, yeah, you got me, I'm a vampire. Is she charismatic because she was able to convince those people to divulge information? Possibly? But I really don't get the sense of personability from the writing. It just seems more like she succeeded in making a bunch of guys really like her, and then those guys just tell her stuff or protect her because she is clumsy as fuck. Oh, that's the one trait that I do have for Bella. She is clumsy and drops stuff all the time, or keeps getting herself into scrapes, and she's also a lightning rod for danger, with the aforementioned truck almost hitting her, and then that gang of men looking to do something probably terrible if we're to believe Edward's mind-reading powers. I should go back there and rip those guys' heads off. Uh, no you shouldn't. You don't know the vile, repulsive things they're thinking. And you do? Uh, it's not hard to guess. Will you talk about something else? Distract me so I won't turn around. You should put your seatbelt on. And that trait of clumsiness and danger attraction is basically what drives the plot forward, because it leads to Edward coming in to save her when she fucks up. So, hardly a good character from the first entry into this series, and it doesn't necessarily get a whole lot better. In the second book slash film, what else do we get to add on to the Bella pile? Well, she is afraid of growing older than Edward, having that whole nightmare of herself as a very old granny, while he looks the same. But yet again, this isn't her having a fear of growing old because that's a natural, mortal fear, nor because it's part of a long-stranding traditional culture that makes women think that looking old cannot be equated with beauty, and that beauty is all they're allowed to offer and so there is fear revolving around that. No, those fears would be interesting, and would give Bella something else aside from revolving her entire fucking life around Edward. She also turns into zombie Bella when Edward ditches, because he is afraid that she is unsafe around the vampires, who potentially could have killed her when she gets a paper cut, sitting in the house and moping for months on end until her dad threatens to send her to Jacksonville, which seems like it's akin to hell, because she then starts trying to do normal stuff like hang out with her human friends, who might as well just not exist at this point. I I do like the idea that you can tell people that you're gonna send them to Jacksonville as a way of getting them to do stuff, but then she starts engaging in reckless behaviour, like approaching a bunch of men and joyriding with them, because she can hear Edward's voice when she does that. So even when Edward's gone, it's still Edward, Edward, Edward all over again. And then the rest of everything else is just more stuff driven by Edward. She helps to fix up some bikes with Jacob, so that she can hear Edward, not because she desperately needs a fucking hobby to get away from that dude. She does help the werewolves in tracking down Victoria, giving them some information about her, and that providing of aid might be the single thing that she does without any real Edward motivation to it in this entire book. And honestly, at this point, I don't need to tell you about the next two books because it's just more of the same thing, and I don't think it's worth it to hammer the point home even harder. Sure, we could waste time on this, and maybe you'd like another half an hour of me talking about how Bella just keeps obsessing over Edward throughout Eclipse, and then she obsesses over Edward throughout Breaking Dawn. And why? Why would I do that? This, this video essay is going to be long enough anyway. We don't need that. Bella is basically just five things. She is clumsy as fuck, slash always in danger. She obsessively loves Edward. She has the ability to be immune to mind powers from vampires. 
she wants to be a vampire, and she is deeply loyal to her family. Oh yeah, I, I guess I could have mentioned the mind power protection thing more, but we already sort of said all that can be said about that. It predominantly exists to make her a center point in the narrative by creating this intrigue around it. Edward being fascinated that he can't read her mind, and that fascination by Edward driving all the other vampires' fascination in her as well. If Edward didn't care about Bella, she honestly wouldn't be in this narrative at all. And that loyalty to family, to those that she considers family, uh, willing to die for them loyalty, has some stuff that I want to talk about more in the author section of this video, but for now all I'll say about it is Mormon. Mormon. Lock that one away in the old memory banks. Mormon. So, what else is there to say about Bella? What else can we dive into with her that I haven't already said? Nothing. Let's move on to the next chapter, and hopefully we can find some other interesting people in the Twilight series. Now, this whole chapter about Charlie, a mini chapter because I need to force myself to not spend like 5,000 words talking about a character who is kinda not that important at all to the narrative, which admittedly saying that does sound insane. He's Bella's father, he is the authority figure and the clearest connection that Bella has to her humanity, especially after the first book slash film, when the rest of her human friends kinda just get shoved into the background, sometimes literally getting shoved into the background, and Jacob turns out to be a werewolf, but that is sort of the case with Charlie. The closest he gets to interfering with anything is when he threatens to send her back to Jacksonville if she doesn't stop with her moping and depression over Edward leaving. And then from that point onwards, he is mostly a passive observer of the shit show from the outside for a few books, and then a very passive observer of the shit show from the inside for the final book. L let me explain, because otherwise I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing in this video essay, so, you know, probably a good idea. See, Charlie Swan was born in Forks, Washington, to two human people called Joffrey and Helm. Sorry, I started just flat out reading the wiki to you on accident, and that's just full of boring details that tell us fucking nothing about the person. No, what I specifically want to talk about with Charlie is his role as a father throughout the show. A father who gives us a human perspective on their romance, and then gives us a human perspective on having the whole supernatural world revealed to you, and, like, not just Bella's perspective which was kind of okay with it. For the first three books and films, Charlie is aware that his daughter has this rather unhealthy romance with Edward, but isn't aware that there is a vampire connection to it instead merely seeing it as teenage obsession with someone who he kinda isn't really that okay with. Like, seriously, he is constantly making sure that she has pepper spray on her, because while he might accept that his daughter is dating this dude, he also clearly doesn't trust Edward whatsoever to protect her, and part of that might be because Bella keeps getting randomly hurt around him, and he doesn't understand the true reason why, so it just seems like she is constantly in danger from vague stuff. Now, we talked about the threat that he kinda applies in the second entry New Moon, trying to send Bella back to Jacksonville due to the depression she sinks into for months, but there are also a lot more elements around that which really give us a light into Charlie's inaction. Bella gets abandoned in some woods by Edward, and he has to set up a search party for her, and then she basically does nothing for ages while he fumbles around doing his best to figure out what he can do at all. It is kind of an interesting portrayal of a man who clearly likes doing something and taking action as a response to issues, finding that he has no real recourse to fix this issue, and that maybe he just doesn't understand or really connect with his teenage daughter. Then, 
out of the blue, Bella starts getting herself into super danger, and then she just fucking runs off to Italy for days with no warning, to which Charlie quite reasonably bans her from seeing Edward or from Edward coming into the house. That, honestly, is not a completely unfair reaction from him, from his perspective, and we as an audience only really get Bella's side on it, where she blackmails Charlie by threatening to move out and leave home if he doesn't backtrack on that punishment. Which, from the side that doesn't have the context, is some pretty fucking weird shit to be going down in a family. Like, for us as the audience, when we know what Bella's going through and how Bella sees this, sure, that makes sense. From Charlie's side, what the hell's going on there, right? Now, Charlie is unfortunately given a real fucking rough go in the third book and film, because the one thing that stood out to me that he did was hearing about the kiss that Jacob forced on Bella against her will, and standing up for Jacob and telling Bella that she basically shouldn't have hit Jacob for doing it. Bad dad of the year moment, and a really telling example of the hashtag Team Jacob bias that Charlie falls into because he feels like Jacob was there for Bella when Edward ran off, and that Bella, I guess, owes Jacob for that. Not cool, dude. Really not fucking cool. You could just tell her that she doesn't need to end up with either of these guys, and that maybe she should make the decision in a way that focuses on herself, rather than the men that she is centred around. But we already covered how that isn't the way that Stephanie Meyer does things, and also that Charlie is too fucking useless as a parent and too out of context to really be much of a grounding figure that Bella can relate to and get advice from. Which is fascinating how the books and the films really do remove her parents from the equation as potential mentors and leave her stranded relying upon the worst kind of people to give her input. It's also incredibly weird that when he finds out that Bella and Edward are getting married, he presumes that it's a shotgun wedding, only to find out that they are virgins and that makes him suddenly go, huh, you know what? Maybe Edward isn't that bad after all. Because, like, what, my dude? that That's the thing that helps change your opinion on the situation? Really? Although, I mean, that being it is not surprising when you consider what we will get into on the chapter about the author herself. Hint. Mormon. Finally, we reach book four. And the real point where Charlie stops being a guy and just becomes a plot point for real, when he basically is just there feeling worried and terrified while Bella is going through the whole pregnancy and vampire process that is supposed to end with her dying, and him just thinking his child died from a disease, and he doesn't get to see her before that point, which is all sorts of fucked up in its own damn way. Like, that's some intense cruelty and lack of consideration from both the vampires and Bella there towards Charlie. But Jacob, being Jacob, decides that his own interests come first, and his interest is stopping Bella from moving away with that child that he imprinted on. Don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that at some point, probably. I don't want to, but we'll do it. And so he introduces Charlie to the supernatural world by turning into a massive wolf in front of him, in direct contradiction of what everybody in the situation wanted. Here goes nothing. What the hell are you doing? You don't live in the world you think you do. Stranger things happen every day. Trust me. Now, while I do think that Charlie should have been brought into the world much earlier, I think that maybe Bella using him and relying on him as like a father figure would have been a great thing to put into the narrative, this isn't like the good way of doing it. This is just a good example of Jacob being a dick again and being super self-absorbed, but Charlie basically just exists in a shocked fugue state for the rest of the book just taking in all of this information without really questioning it or really having a serious freak-out moment about how much worse all this is for Bella now. Seriously, he basically just hangs out in the background and seems fine with all of it, 
And all the context that should have made him more worried and more angry probably doesn't do that. But, I mean, hey, he does end up with Sue Clearwater at the end, so... Props to my guy, at least, being involved in the supernatural world, letting him get a hookup with someone else involved in it too. Uh, Sue Clearwater is the mother of two of the werewolves and a member of the Kiliut tribe that we will talk about in that later chapter that I am absolutely dreading. So where does this leave us with Charlie, with one of the few humans who actually stuck it throughout the series and got at least a few scenes of screen time in each film? who has an essential role as the familial member with which we are most aware of and involved with, and who exists as some kind of figure over Bella's life. Well, it leaves us in kind of a rough spot for giving a shit about him, much like how the series doesn't really care about us giving a shit over any of the humans and their human problems. But beyond that, it also leaves him as a very poorly crafted character, whose attitude towards a situation spins on a dime and seems to be more related to what exactly Stephanie Meyer needed him to be in that moment rather than what he would actually do or how he should actually evolve over time. It honestly inspires for me a few ideas for what you could do in a fanfic to fix this whole series up, but after my failed Harry Potter fanfics, which I will never talk about in depth, no one can ever know the, the, what I wrote, like, ten years ago. Seriously, it, it's embarrassing. It's like the cringest thing I've ever done. I have banned myself from being involved in any kind of fanfic process. But let's consider why Charlie comes off feeling like this, and use what we have discussed about his role in the franchise to illustrate that. See, it's strange how Charlie suddenly flips from being this protective father who doesn't understand his daughter, but certainly wants her to be safe, and wants to look out for her best interests in the first few books slash films, being opposed to the danger that exists around Edward, even if it's a danger he doesn't truly understand due to not knowing about the supernatural world. And he also wants her to be around people who, from his perspective at least, seem to do better at bringing Bella out of the massively depressed shell and obsessed shell that she falls into and exists in with regards to Edward. Another perfectly reasonable reaction to seeing your daughter being in that kind of obsessive, intense, unhealthy relationship with someone else. Of course, we know a bunch of details about why Bella really hangs out more with Jacob and does all of that, and so it's not quite as healthy as Charlie might think it is, but he doesn't know that. Realistically, and honestly from a just being a better father perspective, he probably should have maybe tried to get her professional help, because I think that holding up in your room for months after a boyfriend you have known for like a few months as well, I think at that point, maybe like half a year at most, has moved away and broken up with you, is a sign of some clinical shit that might need to be addressed. Maybe a therapist could also tell Bella that she doesn't need to define herself by her relationships, or rush into things to make those relationships work. But then the plot probably wouldn't happen, so... It's probably a good thing that Forks doesn't have any therapists, I suppose. Or, at least, maybe the plot that we know wouldn't happen. Maybe a plot involving a stronger Bella who defends her humanity and herself as an individual from becoming just part of the Cullens or a vampire would be more interesting. I am writing fanfic again and getting distracted from Charlie, two things I promised I would stop doing. Charlie suddenly changes from being the protective dad in the first entries to being a toxic male in the third one, and then a bystander in the fourth. As we mentioned, he is okay with Jacob non-consensually making out with his daughter because he likes Jacob, and he only comes to like Edward more when he finds out that they haven't banged yet, both of which are not like good things or reasons to be okay with someone, Like, Charlie could have stuck with telling Bella that she doesn't need to be with either of those guys, and that maybe she needs space from them to be aware of herself. But he just isn't the best father, and a theme is his struggle to be a father, 
So, you know what? Fine. Maybe this is just the continuation of that kind of theme. The theme of Charlie struggling to know how to be a dad. But then the way that he is presented in Breaking Dawn is just so disappointing following that narrative. Like, yeah, by the time that he finds out Bella is supernatural and that the Cullens are supernatural, it is a bit late to really input anything as Bella is a vampire and Renesme has been born and is rapidly growing and terrifying audiences across the world, but his just immediate acceptance of it all in a rather out of its state is strange to me including his interaction with Bella, where he basically just hopes that she'll keep visiting him and won't just go away. It's almost sad. Like this sudden rush of new knowledge and information that breaks with his understanding of the world just stops him from being a father to his daughter, who is still only 18. It's been like less than a year since all of this stuff started. The Charlie I saw from the first few films and books should be sick with worry, should be reevaluating all of it and realizing the real horror of all that stuff that went on, should be having panic attacks about the fact that his daughter rushed into marriage, into having a pregnancy, into becoming a vampire, all while she had just become an adult. There isn't much more to say here than that it feels like Charlie being allowed to have a freak out over it and confronting Bella about what happened and about where she is would have been a far better conclusion to his character, especially because it would give Bella an alternate view on things from an adult rather than Jacob's constant whining that seems to revolve only around his own childish narcissism than any serious concern for Bella. I guess I just would have loved to have more counterpoints to the vampire-centric narrative, and Charlie seemed like the perfect person whose involvement should have been concerned for his daughter from a human perspective, but is instead neutered in the interest of maintaining the weird, religiously-influenced narrative about Bella's involvement. That's like involvement combined with evolving. I think it's a good word to define like how she goes over these books, that doesn't really seriously challenge her marriage and childbirth and drastic adoption to a lifelong commitment that exists beyond any human standards of mortality. This is one of our strongest human characters, and he barely exists in the later stuff, really reflecting the way that this franchise lifted off from any kind of grounded moorings with characters and fled into the realm of werewolves and vampires, and Bella being our only human point of reference for viewing it. Personally, I don't really like that in a book. I always hate having only one perspective on things, and I think that more novels can benefit from changing main characters with chapters. And I know that Twilight did do that, there are chapters from Jacob's perspective, but I want more from the humans. That's a minor point. And before we can actually truly move on from Charlie, I have to answer the big question that I know everyone is going to ask about the man. And that is, can we truly support and call the character good if he's a cop? Does a cab not also apply to fictional cops? And to answer that, I I don't know. It's not like this film is copaganda. His being a sheriff is basically only used when he is, like, giving her pepper spray and when he's doing stuff in the background related to, like, trying to make sure she's safe. I don't think anyone is looking at Charlie and coming away with the idea that they should go and become a cop because of how cool he looks. Eh. The police thing doesn't really matter to his character. Charlie doesn't really matter as a character, but the police thing really doesn't matter. Anyway, that's enough Charlie... Let's finally talk about the fucking vampires, and I do mean fucking vampires. Mm, mm, mm. They're apparently sexy, although to me they look a little sick. Now, as might be obvious from the heading into this chapter, we're only going to be talking about the good vampires in this bit, the Cullens and the allies that they pull out of their ass in the final book slash film. 
The Cullens are, of course, the real main interest of the books and films. The vampiric lifestyle that they represent, the big draw that pulls in people with the mystique and the coolness. Much like Bella got sucked into it, almost like a cult of some kind built around relationships. I'm sure there are no parallels here around anything in the real world that ties to Stephanie Meyer, and we can just focus on discussing the Cullens by themselves, as they are shown to us. I mean, look at them. Look at all the humans admiring them and talking about how cool they are. Look at Edward catch that apple on the tray of food with lightning speed. Look at them play baseball while super massive black hole plays. Look at them just being all darn cool and looking cool. But looks can be deceiving, right? Aesthetically, they might seem appealing, and might seem like something that is badass, but are they really just duds, though? That's the big question that I had coming into this chapter that I wanted to think about, because I'm immediately distrusting when it becomes clear that an author or director really wants me to like something, and it feels like they have not put anywhere near enough effort into convincing me that it is actually true. So... Before we get into each of the individual Cullens, which of course we will do, we need to think a little bit more about what being a vampire means in this world. We need to go to a made-up search engine and type in pale ones so that we can then confront the guy who we think is a monster in an abandoned area where he can totally kill us if he actually was a monster. Yeah, that's a smart call. So, the vampires in Stephanie Meyer's world follow a few of the classical traditions and make up a few of their own. They also represent slightly different themes from your classical vampire stories because of the role that they play for us. But let's get into the first thing you can see, and that of course means physical appearance and physical distinctions that are used to clarify them as separate from people. In this realm, there are a few, such as the fact that they get funky-coloured eyes, depending on whether they eat people or animals, either orange or red or yellow or, like, it's in that kind of spectrum, which, if I've learned anything from playing Star Wars The Old Republic, is used to symbolise the dark side, so, like, maybe that's what it's kind of meant to mean here? Or, Or maybe it just looks cool. They also become far more attractive, specifically so that they can, as Alice puts it, like a carnivorous plant, attract their prey better. Now, what this actually translates to is that they look like they're wearing a bunch of makeup and are, like, whiter. And that whole attractiveness is, of course, kind of explicit to these sort of vampires who are trying to be sexy these Anne Rice-style vampires that have honestly really replaced the more classical interpretation of vampires as abominations and monsters that use hypnosis and magical affect to mimic charm on victims. It isn't necessarily because of any kind of theme, it just feels like that they have to do it so the audience is more able to consider wanting to fuck them, and that being chased by this predator is hot rather than creepy. I mean, if Nosferatu's coming for you, like Edward, you're probably going to be, you know, not happy with that. The final physical appearance element that stands out is, of course, that they sparkle in the sun, due to the whole diamond skin thing that I actually think when we see them, like, break each other, it looks more like marble cracking, and they are described as living stone in the books as a way of considering their immortality and state of being as frozen in that particular version themselves like a statue. So, I don't know if they're actually diamond, or like it's like a... I don't know if it's like a crystal, or if it's like a a, just a very hard stone. Also, for this bit, I considered getting a bunch of like, sparkly stuff and pouring all over me, but then I realised that I don't want to do that, so I didn't. Now, Stephanie Meyer describes this as occurring because the cells in their body have become hard as rock and refractive, and I don't know why that is. 
Like, being hard doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to shine more. Like, I don't... It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be refractive if it's, like, compressed matter. That happens with diamonds because it's compressed carbon, but it doesn't guarantee a human's body is going to do the same thing. I, I get that it's a change on the afraid of sun formula because these vampires have very little weaknesses. All that stuff, like the steak, the garlic, the burial dirt, the running water, it's all bullshit made up to give people some hope when facing them by the vampires themselves. But I'm not sure why it's the case. It's not necessarily true that skin being harder immediately guarantees that it's going to be refractive. Like, it does really depend on what material it's mimicking, but at the end of the day, these guys are basically magical, so it doesn't have to mimic anything. I guess what I'm saying is that the sparkly skin thing, while a major plot point in the second book, as Edward is going to reveal his vampire nature to the world, or at least to a small Italian town, is not really that important, and could be replaced with, like, other things. But maybe it's all just a reaction to the extra two chromosomes that vampires get. Yep, you heard me right. In a conversation, Carlisle mentions how vampires get some more genetic code, and that the werewolves, or shapeshifters as they really are, which I will get into in the chapter on them, and I'm sure has been annoying at least one person this whole time, but those guys have 24 chromosomes. What does this mean, you might ask? What what can we take away from the fact that vampires have 25 and that shapeshifters have 24? Pretty much nothing. It's not explained what those extra strands are doing for them, and it's also sort of a flawed understanding of chromosomes, because, like, additional ones don't necessarily equate to getting magical powers or becoming stronger. Like, you could just have a different combination of chromosomes, or you could honestly not have any chromosomal change at all. It's just an odd side comment that I took in and didn't know what to do with. Anyways, moving on to the physical attributes that get changed rather than the physical appearance, vampires of course get to be harder, better, faster, stronger. Like, they can run in this little speed-up way, and they can stop trucks and throw shit, and they also have better tracking capabilities with all their senses massively enhanced. And, I mean, like, they're just designed to be better than people in every possible way. It's almost as if Stephanie Meyer wants us to idolise the vampires and their lives, because it seems so much freaking better, and so that we of course agree with Bella wanting to become one, because why the hell wouldn't you? You would have to be mad to not want that. Or, you would have to understand the major philosophical and potential flaws with the next element of the vampire's attributes, which is of course their virtual indestructibility to match that immortality that comes with living as a frozen, unchanging version of yourself. No cell decay or any of that crap. Because becoming mostly invincible and endless does actually have some massive downsides. There is of course the possibility that something terrible will happen to you, being stretched out over a near infinite amount of time, meaning that it is a reasonable assumption that eventually you will get screwed over by something. Like, the expansion of the sun in six billion years to absorb the earth is an abstract issue for us mortals, but an eventual threat for any vampires out there. And beyond that, what about the heat death of the universe? What, what, what the hell exists after that? All of which is redundant if you just get stuck somewhere forever, like chucked into a hole where you are left to starve and scream as punishment. Something that I personally think the Volturi should absolutely do as a way of dealing with the people who oppose them, rather than just killing and burning them. You gotta send a message, you know, like in Anne Rice's vampires, or in the What We Do in the Shadows vampires. A lot of vampires get thrown into holes, is what I'm getting at here. But I'm getting off track, and a little bit into vampire rights violations, which is of course a joke, vampires have no established rights systems, so they don't have any rights. 
Another side of this immortality conundrum, beyond the physical threats that nobody else has to consider, is the emotional and mental toll of living forever. Experience and hobbies, when stretched over an infinite time, become almost impossible to enjoy, especially if you enjoy the perfect recall and memory that vampires have. Ultimately, you would just be repetitively doing the same things over and over, with no real joy coming from them. And that's not to speak to the potential mental decay that could occur with longer time frames. I mean, the oldest vampires we see are like 3,000 years old, and they are kind of weirdos, but I mean they have to account for the fact that they can feasibly live for a million times that length yet, if not a billion times that length. What the hell do you do with that time? Especially if the humans wipe themselves out in some terrible climate catastrophe or nuclear holocaust. Then you have no changing culture to leech off and have fun with. Because that's an essential part of the vampires, and actually a part of vampires in other pop culture representations, is that when they become vampires, parts of their human side are accentuated, sometimes referring to the magical bullshit powers that we'll get into in a little bit, but also referring to traits that they come to embody more and more. Much as they are physically frozen, they also become kind of mentally frozen as well, which is a very interesting theme that Stephanie Meyer does kind of no work with and barely even utilises in the first place. I mean, heck, it does explain why all the Olympic Coven are basically just one thing, but that could also be attributed to bad writing more than anything else. Oh, and before we transition to talking about the Cullen family, a near-perfect transition as far as I'm concerned, Olympic Coven is just another name for them. The vampires divide themselves into covens for some reason. It's like a rip-off of what witches do, because witches don't exist in this universe, so I guess maybe witches are inspired by vampires who have magical powers as well. Like... I suppose that because we only know that three or four supernatural species exist, that the rest of them might be all just people seeing those, like poorly, and then interpreting vampires or shapeshifters or werewolves as something else. That's by the by, and not really explored in the narrative at all, so let's talk about the Cullens already. Now, the Cullen Coven, slash family, slash whatever term you want to use for it, is actually one of those groups where it's fucking weird when you dig into the details of them. There is the obvious thing I want to talk about here, how each one of them seems to have a designated role that they follow, which mimics that whole vampire's being immortalised and driven to a singular trait. Carlisle is dad energy, Esme is mum energy, Edward is moody AF, Rosalie's just a bitch, Emmett is the jock guy, Alice is a manic pixie dream girl, and Jasper... is... boring? Like, they all just kind of represent those stereotypes throughout the books and films, and every bit of information that we can possibly find is honestly just going to emphasise that. Obviously, I'm still going to dig it up for you, but I just want you to know where this is going already. Another weird thing that I found when I was going through this stuff was that the ages of all of the vampires was so much weirder and closer than I thought. Obviously, all the teenage vampires are teenagers. They are like 18 to 19 years old, with only Emmett being the odd one out, although obviously they aren't actually that age. They are all like 100 to 400 years old. But the thing that really surprised me was that Carlisle is apparently frozen at 23. This guy is 23 years old. And Esme was frozen at 26. She's 26. I I knew that they told people they adopted all those kids because it would not be believable otherwise, considering how close they look in age. But I really thought they were more like... 30s than early 20s. <sighs> it's it's not a big deal. It's just like a casting mistake, kinda. Although, not really, because if they actually did look that young, it would give the Cullens a much stranger vibe, 
and make all the acting like Carlisle and Esme are their parents kind of fucking odd. But anyway, let's do each of these guys one by one and try to keep the rambling to a minimum. Although if you are watching this video at this point, then you know the rambling is kind of my style. There's a 10 hour Harry Potter video. So, you, you know, you get what you sign up for. Carlisle Cullen the original member of this coven, before it was even a coven, is also the oldest member by a fucking lot, being born in the 1600s and turned into a vampire in the sewers of London. When I said earlier on that his trait was dad vibes, what it actually is is that he was very compassionate and kind and nice when he was a human, and so that intensified into the sort of compassion for human life that allowed him to make the vegetarian vampire diet work and to like push other people into doing it as well. It's a sort of weird interpretation of that vampiric thing from the more classical version that we get in stuff like Dracula, Buffy, or D&D, when the positive emotions are twisted into a negative one. But that's because those vampires are far more linked to, like, actual hellish evil and devilry, compared to the, like, just a parasitic replicating species that is the Twilight Vampire. So, that's not a bad difference by itself. It is kind of bad when it sort of annihilates the thematic allegories of vampires and then doesn't replace them with anything, except for, you know, the Mormon thing. There is no real takeaway from a guy who was compassionate is now just really compassionate and really good, except that it fits in the canon of Carlisle as this mentor figure who provides shelter and comfort for others and is meant to be put on a pedestal by us, the audience, because that's how the franchise sees him. He is a goody, goody two-shoes who actually has a brutal history of working for his religious father and tracking down vampires and witches and killing them in a way in which we know those were not really either of those things and they were just innocent people during, you know, the witch-hunting period of the UK. Honestly, there isn't that much to say about him, because this super good character does do some important stuff. I mean, he turned most of the people that we see, but his lack of any real twists and turns means that it is just kind of a boring straight line to where the plot picks up. He was really nice, and travelled around the world being really nice and making friends, and that paid off in that they got a bunch of friends to come and help make sure the Volturi didn't Merc the Cullen family and Bella's kid. He is a useful character for introducing us and Bella to a lot of vampire concepts and theories that Stephanie Meyer wants us to be aware of around the vampires, like the traits and the powers and the chromosomes for some reason, and the abilities that they have, and the societies that they operate within, but aside from being a font of knowledge, there just isn't much more to say. He's a great guy, you get a drink with him or something, although, you know, he's going to probably be drinking, like, animal blood, so, I don't, know if he, I don't know if he drinks beer, but, you know, going to the pub for a beersy with Carlisle, I'd do it. Now, the next one to discuss is not in order of getting turned, because I want to save Edward for near the end, because I think he might take the longest, but it's going to be Esme, the mum of the coven, who became Carlisle's partner after she attempted big warnings here for potentially triggering stuff around suicide, suicide, due to losing her son. Carlisle was super into her after they met when she was 16. I swear to God, official guide of Twilight, what are you doing to me? But, like, he turned her 10 years later... He didn't turn her when she was 16, he turned her obviously when she was 26, which was 10 years later, because of how much she meant to him after he first met her. It's... It's not getting much better. Am I getting the vibes here of those Christian guys who meet underage girls in church groups and then, like, they suddenly get married once they are both of age? A little bit. And that is not as much of a random reading into it as you might think, as we will talk about more in the Maya chapter. Hint again, it's the Mormon shit. It's always been the Mormon shit. 
But fine. What does Esme bring by herself to this narrative, beyond just being Carlyle's wife and the Cullen mummy? Well, much like a lot of the characters that Carlyle turns, as we will find out, the books really want us to know how miserable their life was so that we can feel okay that they became a vampire. Like, their human life sucked ass, and therefore vampire stuff is a massive improvement. Because Esme was an abused wife whose husband abused her before World War I and abused her after World War I so that she ran away when she became pregnant and kept running to get away from him. Only for that child to, you know, do the aforementioned dying as a baby, so she jumps off a cliff. And that's that. Esme was totally cool becoming a vampire and getting married to Carlisle, and she got to take on all those surrogate children and absolutely nothing from her backstory surfaces ever again. She just sort of uh, hovers around in the background being really nice to everybody and warm, and apparently the exaggerated trait that she has was her love and especially her maternal instincts, which is why she slid so easily into being a mum to all of these adult people. Which... You know, not to dog on mothers. Mothers are great. I have a mother. But so many female characters in this book and film are, like, defined by that mother standard. Defined by their motherliness. Or their dedication to babies. And I know the massive flashing warning sign of Mormon, Mormon, Mormon is just looming like the guillotine over this whole conversation. But come on. It... It's just boring and underutilized. And it's boring and underutilized because Esme has this tragic past involving her family and her own child. And you would think that more of that would come out around Bella and her, like, own possible replication of that story. But nope. Stephanie Meyer, in my opinion, is a bad writer. I... (sighs) Reading about the Cullen family has cemented that so strongly for me. Like, here are a bunch of characters who are supposedly pretty heavily featured in the narrative, and my god, do they not do anything at all? There is a subtext, there is text, there are themes, and there are analogies, and then there is this. Just characters doing things because the story wants them to, and that's what the character says that they should do, without, like, exploring it at all. It represents nothing beyond that religious thing that I can't mention again or it will summon one of them to my house and you know how hard it is to get rid of them once they come around a knocking. Anyway, Carlisle and Esme are sort of duds. They are too good. Too overly great with zero flaws or issues at all. Honestly, if they were main character inserts, I would happily consider them to be... Manny Soze's, or whatever the fuck that term is for bland, perfect people and stories. But maybe the kids are better. Maybe the children have more going for them, more exploration of themes and identity that comes from their long histories that we get developed over the course of the franchise, and the illustrated guide which gives us, honestly, like, it's more words, but it's like, the same amount of information, realistically. It could happen. Right? It, it, it could get better from here. Get an older woman. Huh? What? You first, Rosalie. And it's a guy. A guy's guy. Just a man being a man. Boys being boys. Masculinity, but for vampires. Seriously, though, that, that is like the entirety of his character. Defined by his youth spent drinking and womanizing, and then being a woodsman before getting mauled by a bear, which... Riverdale told me it's a very survivable thing, but I, I'm gonna guess that Riverdale's not a reliable source for facts. Bro, I'm warning you. You don't want to start with me. Dude, what the hell happened? How'd you get those scars? I was attacked by a bear. What? You serious? You were attacked by a friggin' bear? Damn. He's rescued from the bear by Rosalie, who we'll get into in just a second, who, like, fell in love with him because all the vampires seemed to boringly bond to a single other person, and then she dragged him for 100 miles to Carlisle so he could term Emmett, and then they were both together and married, like, from that point onwards. 
Emmett's whole personality is that he is strong. He likes to fight, and he spends most of the books and films just flexing and wanting to brawl with the others. He's also apparently a jokester, but I think that's because he makes comments about others that are meant to be comedic, even if they don't really land as funny. His big focus is truly on how muscled he is, and how big he is, and how much he loves all that mm, manly stuff. Oh, he also murdered a girl on accident one time because she smelled too sweet to him, but like he said, you, you can't wallow in your guilt forever. Wow, that's like the ideal frat bro. Destroyed a girl's life and it's just like, ah, what are you going to do? That's Emmett. No, uh, seriously, th that that's Emmett. We're going to move on now. Rosalie is Emmett's partner, and she might honestly be the most interesting vampire aside from possibly Edward himself, and honestly actually might be more interesting than Edward. She is also the worst one of the bunch by far, being pretty manipulative and very, very whiny and annoying, but shit, sometimes the spoiled meat has the most fascinating patterns. Rosalie is, like almost all of them, the result of a tragic situation leading to her almost death and the start of a vampire life, though hers is definitely the most tragic of the bunch and the most brutal. Like, Trigger warnings for just a bunch of sexual assault and rape and not good stuff. And it's all things that come to light for us in the audience quite significantly in Breaking Dawn, when Rosalie takes centre stage as the main defendant of anti-abortion Bella, giving us a real insight into the character so we can understand why she is doing this rather unselfish act of defending Bella's choice to give birth to the baby that is actively killing her, which is... Generally, a good argument for abortion, to be honest. If the baby is going to kill the mother, that sounds like a good, good time to do it. By making us realise that it is in fact a very selfish choice on Rosalie's part, and very self-centred around her own desire for a baby, and her okayness with Bella dying so she can get her hands on the child afterwards. I mean, it's not explicitly said that that's what it is, but it also kind of explicitly is. Anyway, Rosalie was a rich woman during the Great Depression, who was shallow and egocentric, and like the stereotype of the pretty princess who gets spoiled into being a brat, and then into being a vacuous adult. Her only desire, in her own words, was to find a husband, to have a house, to be a mother. Wow, crazy, right? Another woman whose only point of reference for existing is this archaic notion of womanhood. I wonder if that's been a fucking recurrent fucking theme so goddamn far. But anyway, this backfired terribly when her fiancé and his friends gang raped her because Royce, her fiancé, kept telling everyone how beautiful she was. Like, Jesus Christ. That feels... A lot heavy. Like, way too heavy for this franchise so far. There's been murders, but that's a big one to drop on us. So, Carlisle saves Rosalie from death by turning her into a vampire, though we find out that Carlisle did it apparently according to Edward, just so Edward could have a mate. Which, I mean, that's not cool at all, or a good justification. And, like, I am already tired of this treatment of women by the characters and the way the women themselves seem to be okay with it. Because Rosalie doesn't get mad at that. She gets mad that Edward rejects her after she's brought back. She's not upset that she was only really brought back by Carlisle so that Edward would finally stop going around moping about how lonely he was. She was brought back for just you know, to be someone's partner. I'd be mad about that. She's mad that Edward doesn't want her. She then goes on a murder spree of all the men who <sighs> gang raped her, which is honestly perfectly justified, before settling down with the Cullens due to not having anywhere else to go as a vampire, and then that just leads into the Emmett thing, and basically her whole character stops there. It's interesting that, like, not just their characters are frozen, but also their, like, narratives are frozen too. I wonder if there's, like, a... Like, is that, like, a theme, do you reckon? Or is that just bad writing? But this build-up 
this center around narcissism and egocentric notions of her ideal life fuel the concept that we get of Rosalie in Breaking Dawn. When she suddenly and randomly flips over to being on Bella's side after not really giving a shit about her for the first three films slash books. It is fascinating to watch this manipulative monster at work behind the scenes, because while she is one of the good vampires, and continues to be a good vampire, I think she might be a bad person, no matter how much she just doesn't eat people. Like, not eating people is a good start for being called a good vampire, but there are a few more ways to be a better person, and Rosalie does not succeed at those. Which is great! It's great to see a Cullen who is complex and complicated and represents an emotional danger to Bella rather than a physical one. It's a shame that it doesn't go anywhere as a theme or doesn't lead to any real conflict beyond a few arguments for the end of the first part of Breaking Dawn, B- but hey. It, it, it was a good attempt at sowing the seeds of civil war in the Cullen Coven before the Volturi came back to be the real outsider villains again. It was, it was so close to having an interesting story arc. It was, it was like, it was like almost there. Our third to last Cullen vampire, which doesn't get a fancy word like penultimate, is Alice who seems like she should be the most interesting, what with having magical powers to be able to see the future, or at least specific kinds of futures, depending on who she is focusing on, and it's not actually even that reliable, it like it can change because the future can change, in which case that's just good guesswork, I suppose. But she is unique in the sense that she is one of the few vampires that wasn't turned in this coven by Carlisle, and actually joined his little group afterwards, thanks to one of those aforementioned visions telling her that that's what she should do, and she was actually turned by some other random nice guy vampire who did it so she couldn't be killed by the douchebag James. That bad vampire who tracks girls he finds interesting, which is all kind of gross. But yeah, She also kind of had a rough life pre-vampire, being locked in an asylum thanks to her visions as a human, which is interesting because it kind of confirms that these vampires all had these powers in some form as humans. And no, no, we're not talking about powers yet. I wanted to do them all at once. We're talking about Alice here. Focus. Okay. Alice is sort of interesting by virtue of the power of her gift, giving her a lot of presence in the narrative as she interacts with Edward and Bella's relationship, and stops the Volturi, and sort of sees the whole plot of the film coming, but like in little snippets and missing some pretty essential details, like that whole fucking pregnancy thing, which, yet again, is clarified because she can't see half-vampires for... reasons. It's tricky to not want to talk about powers here, because her power is sort of the only and most unique thing about her. Oh, and of course I guess she is another wife character with her husband Jasper, who is... there. She's also just another Cullen who is nice and kind and friendly and loving and oh my god, I want to fall asleep. Like, I get it. She is kooky, but the kookiness is so downplayed, it it might as well not even exist. They should have gone really weird with it. Real goblin energy stuff. Oh, actually, sorry, there there is one sort of weird thing about Alice having a whole bunch of, like, semi-Cinderella stuff around a remarrying father and an evil-slash-cold stepmother and secretly finding out her father is the real terrible man who killed her mother and plans on killing her and so she gets thrown in that aforementioned asylum where she suffers, like, really terrible stuff because, you know, it was a classic mental asylum at the turn of the century in the USA. Uh, You know, those things weren't good. Only abated by that friendly vampire who did his best to try and protect her. And she also, like, loses her memory after getting turned, mimicking the losing her memory from electroshock therapy. And all of that, all of that seems like it could be so interesting. 
but it really isn't. Everything I'm describing here barely makes it into the Twilight story and is only really brought up in the official guide, and so it seems to have about as much impact on your perception of the character as just not knowing it would have. It's it's the problem that I have with a lot of stuff where it's like the, each of the vampires is so boring, but they have all this cool stuff in the backstory. You're like, oh, what if that played in the character? What if there was like some terrible stuff in there? Like, let characters have bad moments. Let them be bad people. Let them be awkward or terrible or weird because that gives them character that we as an audience can really get our teeth into rather than them just being there and nice. And, sorry, I just saw myself in the camera and I realised that I kind of look like one of those, like, TV executives at Netflix. Like, ah, you see you've come to us with another vampire story. (laughs) We'll give you one season, but if it's got gay people in it, we'll cancel it. So, Jasper. The penultimate character to discuss in this section, I finally get to say the word penultimate, hooray, it's every creator's dream to get to say that word, is one that I have decried for being so fucking boring. And while that is absolutely true for the first few books slash films, where his whole personality is stand stiffly and freak out around blood because he has problems with that, which, as we find out later, is because maybe Jasper isn't all that boring. Well, no, he is still boring as a character, but maybe his history is, like, at least slightly worth talking about? And you know what? At this point, that sounds good enough to me. See, Jasper was a Confederate soldier, and not just any soldier, a major too in the Texas Army that fought to make sure that the states had their rights to keep enslaving people. Someone better than me has already discussed the way that vampires keep ending up being confederate soldiers, looking at you vampire diaries too, and you should go watch that video for a deep analysis of that bit explicitly. Because in this one I want to talk about how Jasper ended up getting vampired, so he could be an army leader for a coven that was involved in the southern vampire wars, which were wars that were fought in the south between vampires. Yeah I know, really fucking detailed stuff. But Jasper has some cool elements in his backstory, especially built around his power, the power to control emotions and feel them, which apparently came at the cost of having emotions of his fucking own. But he's also an executioner of newborns, after they'd served a year in the army to make sure that the vampires do not grow too large in number. Yada yada yada, he gets away, there is some shenanigans, and he ended up with Alice, who saved him and married him, and all that finding the one true Mormon love thing. Jasper is still, however, stuck with a bloodlust from his time in that army, which is why he freaked out around blood, and also why he teaches them how to fight newborns in the third book slash film. And that's it. That's kind of his whole thing. Like I said, the, the more fascinating stuff in Jasper's story is not him, it's the history and backstory that it gives us on the lives of vampires. Like how there is a difference between the South with its massive wars in the 19th century and the North coexisting peacefully at the same time. Which is probably some kind of comment on something. Although honestly, I'm not sure what that is meant to be allegorical for. Are American Southerners more violent or more passionate while the North is more rational and willing to exist together? Is is that what it's trying to symbolise? Probably not, but, I mean, it's either that or nothing, so, I guess. But final, final, finally, we have Edward Cullen. And we're not going to mention what's her name at all in this paragraph, because we've discussed everything we need to talk about with her in her own chapter. You know who. Edward is the first vampire that Carlyle turned, and he actually didn't really exist as much of a coven at first with Edward acting as more of a vigilante Batman for a bit, hunting down and eating murderers and rapists with his magical power to read people's minds. 
Like, he would minority report bad guys without having to rely on these dodgy magic balls to tell him, and, you know, the balls that can then get tricked by the fact that other people can just use the right tactics to, like, cheat the system and point them in the wrong direction, which is, I'm just detailing the plot of minority report at this point. He doesn't have that issue, because he is judge, jury, and executioner of seeing a crime in someone's mind knowing they're going to do it, and having the physical strength to finish them off. Of course, this weighs heavily on his mind as a terrible thing to do, and he still feels as if the murder of people for sustenance makes him a bad guy. But also, like... They were really bad people. Like, really, really bad people. And if he hadn't stepped in with his almost perfect system of stopping crime then a lot of people would have been really hurt and potentially murdered. I'm not saying that I advocate for a system of vigilantism by those with power, but Edward's method of doing it according to the books are ones that fix a lot of the issues with the dystopian versions presented in other stories. In other ones, it's a case of they don't really know the truth. Maybe people can be good. But for Edward, he's literally catching them seconds before they're going to do the crime, and he can see them planning out the crime in his head. Like, that that completely circumvents, like, Batman's issues and stuff. But ultimately, he comes around to realising that killing people is biblically bad, it's up there with the commandments, and they should go vegetarian. And then he just, like, stops really doing all that vigilante stuff at all until he starts saving Bella from a load of dangerous stuff, like trucks and men. Edward could still just be a vigilante without having to kill people. He could stop the murderers and the rapists without, you know, having to eat them. Edward's only other defining feature in this period before the Twilight story truly begins, with whatever her name was, is his constant loneliness and refusal to return affection to any of the potential suitors thrown at him because we need him moody and mopey and single for reasons. Yeah. What's her name? Oh, and, and also, he keeps inheriting his wealth to himself. A, a little bit of side information that I guess a lot of vampires must do to try and hold on to that material wealth that is run through our systems. Like, if you don't control a whole ass town and society like the Volturi, then you've got to do some wacky little legal stunts so the truly scary people don't get suspicious, i.e. the IRS. Those bastards will take anyone down, and I think they would hunt a vampire if needed. Oh, that'd be so cool. It's like a story about like vampires that have like been cheating on their taxes because they've been inheriting the wealth to themselves, and then like IRS vampire hunters have to come and get them. Stephanie Meyer, I'm just saying. Hit me up. And this is sort of everything Edward that exists without having to mention that person. So I guess we're done here, and it's time to say her name again. Bella. We're going to talk about Bella now. It, it, Edward is done by himself. It's, it's Bella's time to shine again. So Edward and his relation to Bella from his perspective and his actions is a bit of a different view. Obviously we know how he is portrayed as both the stronger one of the pair, being the one that is afraid of hurting her with his dangerous nature, and also that he is opposed to Bella becoming a vampire, being afraid that he is corrupting her or damning her soul to the same life that has haunted him denying himself happiness, and also denying Bella her wishes because he finds suffering more honourable, I guess. What's an emo guy, huh? There are, of course, good reasons to want Bella to not be turned into a vampire, and Edward does express a few of them. But ultimately, he gets overridden, and the corruption aspect was never really that convincing unless you are, you know, Christian. We've covered this already, the threats and danger of immortality and vampire life, the way it kind of feels culty, especially in how you are cutting yourself off from your family and your friends, which is why a lot of the vampires that got turned are the ones who had no other recourse or life, like they were already dying or lost their families or whatever, so it doesn't feel as bad what happens to them, but with Bella it's clear that she has friends and family that she's going to just lose by becoming a vampire and she can't really go back to. And that's kinda Edward. There is obviously stuff about his obsession with Bella 
and his attitude towards Jacob, which is dismissive and actually kind of adult in the sense that he doesn't seem to really mind that much if Bella chooses to make out with Jacob, only really being angry when Jacob forces himself on Bella, which is a totally fair thing to be, and the right attitude towards that situation. But then that also ties into the way that he is described in Midnight Sun, that random side book that I am sure we totally won't talk about again at some point, don't worry about that, where we see that Edward does truly view all the humans as literally children, which is both true in itself and also true compared to his position as a 100-year-old super adult. It, it just emphasises that point, a point that I don't think Stephanie Meyer should want emphasised. So what is the solution to all of this? And I've brought up a lot of stuff and the solution might not be that simple, but I think the solution might be one that has been explored a little bit already. In that aforementioned Midnight Sun, which I promised we wouldn't talk about again, and yet here we are. Because that gave us a lot more context on Edward. Not necessarily good context, or context that made any of the romance feel better, but it gave us his perspective and allowed us as an audience to see a lot more into the character of these vampires. If every single one of the Cullens had their own little novellas, that would form a franchise perspective at least, hopefully meaning that they would have more development and more identity that is given time to grow on us as we get to grips with who they are. Though this doesn't really fix the base issue, which is the core books and the core film itself, which cannot rely upon post editions from other side books that nobody, and I mean nobody, should have to read to feel as if they're finally getting some good character moments and essential details towards understanding what is happening in the originals, it is something that at least could fix it now. The problem's already there. At this point, you're just trying to patch up the shaky foundation. This is something that I'd like to get into more on the chapter about the world of Twilight, because I've always thought that one of the trickiest things with franchises is knowing when you need to write additional stuff that is useful for the stories you've created and for expounding upon the greater narrative, and when you should just leave some of it up to the audience's interpretations, or the audience understanding that we just don't really need to know all that stuff. But that's enough about the Cullens, and I want to talk here about the other good vampires that we meet, all the ones that turn up at the end to lend their aid towards protecting the family from the Volturi. And the best way I can think to describe them is that Stephanie Meyer watched the X-Men trilogy and really wanted to do her own version of that, but with vampires. And yeah, this is actually going to be more about the powers, because the other vampires are kind of in this for too little time to really have any impact, except for letting us know that Carlisle has made a lot of friends, and that he can call on those friends to respond to the Volturi coming after him, because they have looked for an excuse to deal with him and his threatening position for a long time. That's pretty much the summary of all of them. The powers becoming the big thing for Breaking Dawn Part 2, and the last half of the book, felt really out of left field, and almost deliberately designed just because Stephanie Meyer kept coming up with cool ideas that she wanted to shove in and needed an outlet for, something that I can totally appreciate conceptually as a writer. Sometimes you have stuff that's depressing you that you can't put in, and so you force Rami Malek to become the avatar in the script even when nobody knew that they wanted that. Remember that? Remember how there's a character whose whole power is just they can control the elements and it's honestly just busted level strong? Well, what kind of brief look would we be doing if we didn't consider each and every character and their power and what they mean for the franchise? Hint, it's normally very little, so don't get your hopes up too much here. I also want you to consider how powers exist within the vampire world because Carlyle speaks on it a little bit with some authority, even if it's not confirmed. From Alice and from Bella, we get the sense that these powers exist in some format even when the people are humans, which means that all these powers had to manifest in a weaker form that I guess then gets amplified by the extra few chromosomes that vampires have, because that's how genetics works. Oh, I guess it's literally like the X-Men in that case. I was joking, but this feels more and more true. Like, here is a literal Stephanie Meyer quote about it. I've always loved superheroes. 
So the vampires I created actually have a lot more in common with superheroes than with horror genre vampires. Anyway, let's get on with all these vampires with powers. Wait, how many are there? That many? You can't make me talk about that. No, 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 no. I, I flat out refuse to talk about that many vampires and that many powers. I'm done. I'm done here. You, you can't make me do this. Vampire powers. So of course we already talked about the main cast powers, like Bella's mind block that she can use to protect others, Edward's mind reading powers that he used to Batman his way through Cockney London in it, Alice's pretty vaguely useful powers of sort of seeing the future, that the future is not set in stone, and she is more just seeing the most likely plan of action and how things would turn out, which is... I mean, it's sort of seen the future. It's, it's more like expert data analysis or insurance agency prepping. And Jasper, who can suck the energy out of a crowd of actors. Oh wait, sorry, that's just what he does in real life. He can manipulate and see feelings, which is sort of similar, I guess. But Stephanie Meyer couldn't stop there. Oh no, 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 no. This apparently super rare occurrence of powers thing keeps going on and on, and makes it seem like being a vampire without powers is more of a surprising slash depressing situation than the reverse. Like, if you don't get a magical superhero ability, you should feel bummed out. Oh, sorry, they aren't called powers, they're called talents in the books, because otherwise it would seem ridiculous. Anyway, we've got Renesmee's ability to insert thoughts into people by touching them, and also, like, transfer visions and shit, which was essential to the plot of Breaking Dawn, not getting cool, and instead faking it out with that big-ass battle. And I'll be talking more in depth about Renesmee and her role in a little mini-chapter after this chapter, so don't worry people who are clamouring for that one, you get your wish. Hooray, Renesme. So next we have one of the evil guys, Arrow, and we won't talk in depth about their evilness here, instead just focusing on their powers, who can touch people and then see all the thoughts and like memories they have ever had as he holds onto them. Another person whose power was going to be pretty essential towards making sure that the badass, awesome, shocking battle full of deaths and twists and turns and seeing the powers actually get used that made everybody think that finally, finally, these films have gone in a different direction to the books and done something interesting was all a massive fake out and everything was still the same and anything even slightly consequential or fascinating like watching all the vampires and werewolves that we had come to, I was going to say care about but I'm gonna stick with just no instead because I don't want to put words in your mouth, get brutally murdered and torn apart in a battle that showcased how fucked up superpowered beans can be. Yes, but also no, because it's a fake out. I'm still really mad about that scene and how it really panned out, because like that could have honestly saved the whole franchise by giving it a real send-off with some weight and drastic horror. Like, romance with slight horror for just ages and ages, and then an all-out underworld-style bloodbath to cap it off is a much more interesting concept for me, Netflix executive, going out for the night. And before I get sucked down an underworld rabbit hole, like, does anyone else remember that series existing? The next powered person is another evil guy called Marcus, who could see the relationships between people, like he was one of those conspiracy theory boards with all the coloured links that video essayists use when they have got too deep into a series and which are noticeably absent in my videos. So that's how you know these are just purely brief skim throughs on the franchises. Until those boards turn up, you can't complain I've gone too far. Afton is another Volturi guy who has the power to become invisible to those who are pursuing him. But it's not like physically invisible, it's just that they can't 
see him. There ain't much to say about this man, except that the official illustrated guide tells us that he's only on the Volturi team because his partner is valuable, which is oof, ouch, owie, that's gotta sting the old ego. Alec is another, another Volturi guy who could make a paralyzing mist, who the Volturi uses to begin their assaults on covens that they wipe out. Chelsea, who doesn't exist in the films and is Afton's better half, can mess with the emotional bonds of people, like breaking friendship or making people like each other more. It is useful, but it's weird, and it's very clear that when you try to think of, like, people-based powers, you could run out pretty quickly of ideas. You just sort of get to ones like this one where it's like, oh, they can, you know, make friends stop being friends, and they can make you better friends with people. They're like... One of those apps, I assume. Corin is another, another, another Volturi. Okay, I think we get it. There are lots of powerful Volturi, which is literally because that's part of their model of governance that we will get into on their own chapter, who can make people feel content with where they are and makes them addicted to her power so that they can't leave, which she uses to make the Volturi bosses' wives stay in the castle. We'll get into that later. She's basically like a Netflix show. You turn it on and you just can't, you just can't get away. You're there and then you look up and you go, oh god, it's been 10 hours. I should have done work today. Dimitri is a tracker man, though there are a lot of tracker men in the vampire universe, but his specific tracker power lets him scent people's minds and hunt them down through that. Heidi is a woman whose power has been super attractive to everyone and she uses that to attract tourist food, i.e people for the Volturi so they can eat them. Wow, a woman using her sexy power to manipulate people and who wears a red dress in the film? I wonder if that's ever been done before. Jane is the Volturi you are probably most aware of. She is the creepy little lady who can make people think they are being tortured and fuck them up, and she is clearly very much enjoying the experience of doing it. Renata has the ability to make people who come after her in an aggressive way get confused and forget what they were doing and just sort of leave her alone instead, which is probably the funniest power we've mentioned yet and is the least potentially fucked up power because all it is is just a vague protection aura. It doesn't like hurt people or mess with them, it's just like you walk towards her and she just goes and you just go, oh shit, yeah, what am I doing? Um, fuck up, I guess I'll go attack that person over there though instead. I... That's a cool power. Stephanie Meyer, 10 out of 10 for that power specifically. Zafrina is a member of what's called the Amazon Coven, and I'm not sure if that means that her and the two other people are the only Amazonian vampires or what, but she has the power to summon visions that people can see, which she uses to create the Amazonian rainforest in the books, and that she uses to entertain the child with in the books as well. She doesn't really get to use it in the fake combat battle at the end, which is pretty sad, just making the good guy vampires blind so that they don't attack the Volturi when the Volturi straight up murder one of their friends to provoke them into doing it. It's like a really useful and cool power. It seems weird that we don't really get to see it in action more, although I assume that's probably because of budget concerns. Elisa can identify the powers that people will have when they are vampires, and also what kind of powers people have as vampires. So it's just like using the identify spell on permacast. And it's a useful tool for telling us a bunch of information about people's powers, but it's not really that cool in itself. It's great for the audience as like a tool to connect us with like, oh, so this is literally what those powers do. But other than that, it's like, whatever. Kate is a friendly vampire who is part of the other good coven, as in the only other vampire coven that has golden eyes because they eat animals rather than humans, and she can make electricity across her body that zaps people. We're starting to get more into the real Marvel-esque powers with these ones that have some actual CGI effects, even if it is kind of underwhelming in the film. Benjamin is the Avatar, Master of all four elements, who vanished when the world needed him most. Four books slash movies have passed, and we, the audience, finally get to see him in action, though his powers are somewhat restricted because otherwise the budget would get blown on this one person, and Twilight is not going to spend money when it doesn't need to. 
But from the first moment that we saw him, we knew that Rami Malek was at least going to do one cool thing in the film, and he does in that fake vision that isn't a real battle. He, like, smashes the ground, and it's like the... cracks open. Did you get that I was doing a meme on that famous anime that we all know, the Avatar? Because... Video essayists take the easiest route to comedy. He also seems like the only vampire that Jacob just immediately likes because his powers are so fucking cool, which is honestly fair enough. Maggie is another good vampire, who can tell if people are lying to her. We sort of peaked with Benjamin, and then it all just went like right back downhill after that. Siobhan is from the same coven as Maggie, and is basically just Domino from Marvel, in that she can influence outcomes to be in her favour. Although Domino is more naturally doing it, and Siobhan needs to focus on it. Like, it's a really cool power. It's one of the coolest powers, but it's actually quite hard to make it look cool, unless, I guess, you are the Deadpool movie. In which case, I suppose it's actually quite easy to make it look cool. Like, seriously, all Siobhan does with it is wish really hard that the Volturi don't fight them. And, hey, look, that's exactly what happens. Is it because of her? We don't know, but it would be very funny to confirm that the only reason the Volturi don't fight them is because Siobhan just goes, mm, I hope they don't fight us, and then that's just like it. Like, she could just stop all world conflict by just going, mm, I hope it doesn't happen. James, the bad vampire from the first book, is another good tracker man. He can, like, predict where people are gonna go, but he's also dead, so, you know, fuck him. And Victoria is, of course, his mate, who is the villain of the second one, maybe, kinda. I'm, I'm actually not sure who the villain really is in the second Twilight film. Like, is it just depression? Or is it Stephanie Meyer forcing a Romeo and Juliet reference really hard with the whole Edward thinks Bella is dead by suicide, so he's going to kill himself by suicide? Ooh, that tragedy's never been done before in a romance. But anyway, Victoria has the power to keep herself alive, apparently. Like, she has a spider sense for when she's going to be in trouble, though she still ends up dead as fuck by the third book slash film, so she can't have been that fucking good at self-preservation then huh <laughs> sorry just like, the idea of like a power where it's like oh my power is that i'm really good at not dying it's like so what did you do in the film and it's like i died fred is a guy who only really exists in a side book that you would never know about if you hadn't read the short second life of brie tanner so i suppose we don't really need to talk about him that feels good to be able to say that that we don't need to talk about someone I lied, I lied, it doesn't. His power is that he can make people physically repulsed by him. Like, even just thinking about him makes them want to go away. Ugh, that's, that's so much better. I, I hate not talking about everything. Like, if I know there's a vampire with powers and I don't tell you about it, then, like, did I even know? But yeah, Fred sure seems like a guy. Like, his whole thing is just that people get disgusted by him. Like, he's the Andrew Tate of the Twilight franchise. Anyways, we're so close to done with these powered vampires. With Alistair being another tracking man who can sort of just sense living people and how far away they are from him because vampires and tracking ability is just one of those cop-out powers to hype up and just you can shove it onto any of them because vampires, they hunt people. So if you've got no ideas, just make them a hunting of people vampire power. And Maya is nothing if not the literal queen of cop-outs. And he uses his power in the book slash films one time to run away when the Volturi gets too close and he realizes how many Volturi there are. It's sort of like designed to get us and the other good guy vampires scared about the coming danger that then doesn't go anywhere or get any kind of payoff because of, well, either it's Alice's fault or maybe it's Siobhan's fault for wishing too hard that the plot doesn't get interesting. Finally, our last vampire is Charles who turned up the Volturi to confirm that they were right to wipe out the Cullens, only to use his power of lie detection to realise that the Cullens were innocent and leave. Wait a minute. Maggie had lie detection too. 
I knew she doubled up on the tracking powers like a bunch, but she at least tried to make those different. Stephanie Meyer just literally doubled up on the same power for these people. The, could, could she really not think of any more powers to give people, so she had to do the same fucking thing twice? So those are all the vampire powers. And I'm not counting the passive traits that vampires have that others describe as just being better, like Edward's speed or Rosalie's beauty, because those are not powers, that's just like natural biological differences. There's nothing fancy about it. Like, if it was flash level super speed, fine, but it's not. But what was the point of listing all these powers, except for adding like 2,000 words to this essay and ensuring that my OCD doesn't crop up again and make me go, no, you didn't say everything. And the point was that I wanted to get you thinking about what these powers mean, beyond just here is cool stuff that people can do that is like on top of the general cool appeal of being an immortal, super strong and fast vampire. Because in all these other powered franchises, the powers have a meaning to them, and themes that are tied to that meaning. In the X-Men, which I have mentioned a few times now, powers are of course mutations that exist from birth, and that leave those of them as outcasts and regarded poorly by both the wider society and the government. A reflection of minority struggle and the difficulties facing groups such as queer people, who similarly fight for the right to exist and deal with horrendous persecution for merely being who they are, and of course, who also have magical powers. That's a little trade secret for you there about queer people. In other cases, such as Superman or Spider-Man, it's a matter of responsibility and figuring out what having great power can mean in regards to what you owe to others. It's about learning that having superpowers does not make you better, and what it means is that you are obliged to use those powers in the service of aiding society and others. And we could spend days here digging through all the different superheroes, but that's an entirely different video that will just probably never get made or finished, and the best takeaway from this is that there are as many themes that apply to our lives and apply to us as an audience as morals or ideologies or allegories with empowered characters as there are stars in the sky or dollars in Stephanie Meyer's monster fetish franchise. But with Twilight, I'm left struggling to figure out what the powers in general are meant to mean. My first instinct, and the one that I think seems to be most applicable to those that we know, is that it reflects parts of who they are. Bella is protective of those she loves, and wants to help them, so her power as a vampire lets her extend her shield to cover others. Arrow is controlling and wants power over others, so his lets him see through their thoughts and their past and history, so that he can use it against them. Jasper is able to sense and manipulate the emotions of others because he is a good general who can understand his soldiers and control them. Though it doesn't necessarily make sense outside of combat situations as a power, because the guy has the emotiveness and charisma of a block of wood. That might be a bit harsh to the block of wood. And you could use this to try and connect threads with almost all the other vampires if you wanted to. Though I feel that some of them might become very tenuous. Especially when you move out of the immediate Cullen family that we are aware of and deal with all the other vampires that have about as much character as the humans. I have no idea why some of the Volturi can sense relationship bonds, or be super attractive, or anything. We don't get enough time with any of them to really see why that might be the case. Rami Malek is the Avatar. I don't think it's got anything to do with a character trait. I think it just looks cool as fuck to control all the elements. This interpretation actually reminds me a lot of another show with a similar kind of powers. Another show that does it far better, and that's possibly just because they have more time, but I disagree with that assessment because some characters in that show only get a few minutes of backstory, and that's Misfits, a classic black comedy low-budget British show revolving around a city that gets struck by a storm cloud that gives everyone powers that build into their character narratives. A guy whose whole life we see revolving around dairy products and their work? He can now control milk and yoghurt and cheese, and he becomes a villain because of the inferiority he feels compared to other powers, which matches the bland inferiority he felt in his pre-power life. It's a really great show, 
and all the powers are clever and well thought out, and there's a gender bend power that leads to some fascinating episodes exploring identity and shit. You know, if this video gets a million views, one million views, I will add a misfit brief look to the things that I have promised and would love to do. But Misfits as a show is the comparison I have in my head when I was rereading and rewatching Breaking Dawn. And I felt like Stephanie Meyer was far weaker for not giving us much insight into the powers of these other characters, and also for weakness of the links between the powers and the holders in a lot of cases. Edward is a great example of this, for me at least, in that I don't get why his power is reading people's minds. I know that it's used narratively to obviously let Edward instantly know that Bella is immune to it, and that triggers his intrigue that leads to the romance, and that's the whole goddamn plot happen. But aside from that, following the notion that powers are thematically a way for us as an audience to see a character's traits and identity be developed upon, which is quite hard in some cases, I mean, I'm still not convinced on that Jasper one that I gave earlier, like, it's said in the books that Edward was capable of reading people as a human, that he had great insight into others, so that's why it became mind-reading. But that's not character development in itself. We don't really see Edward as being someone who's insightful. I never really get a sense of Edward as being this person who can truly read people outside of that power. Honestly, it barely feels like he understands what's going on with Bella most of the time, and he can't read her mind. And this is where the misfits' powers actually win out for me as narrative tools, because they are normally reflective of desires or flaws, or accentuations that are then expounded upon. This is the classical vampire thing of the twisting of everything that made you, you as a human, into a dark and sadistic version of that. If someone was compassionate, they would become cruel and manipulative, and able to twist people to their whims, rather than just becoming super compassionate, which is kind of boring, and doesn't do anything or add anything. For the vampires, it would have been fascinating to see more powers that are like an accentuation of their flaws than their supposedly character-defining traits. Because then we would get more emphasis on like, oh, this is a power that builds into something that they're not good at, or they weren't good at as a human. But the vampire thing makes up for that flaw, and gives them that power to sort of like compensate. That would have been really cool, and I'm writing... I'm writing fanfic again. I keep doing this. And to conclude this whole talents or powers talk, because it has gone on too long now, and even I can see that, I don't know if this is necessarily all a bad thing. I do think it's not good writing, and I don't think it's good from a thematic point of view, but I honestly don't know if that really matters. I think the powers were included because Maya thought they would be cool and thought of a bunch of scenarios and stories that revolved around them and relied upon them existing, and then they just became more and more prevalent as vampires were introduced and she thought of other powers that they could have. Maybe they don't mean anything, but maybe they don't need to. They can just be a fun, silly addition to let people dream about, ooh, if I became a vampire, what cool power would I get when that hunky, attractive vampire turned me? Whew. I need to cool off. This is the problem with quality and enjoyment. They're not necessarily reliant upon one another to exist. And the only real way to change things is to engage in fanfic but there is no way that we can possibly talk about that in regard to Twilight. Nobody's out there writing fanfic for this franchise after all. Renesmee. Renesmee. Let's get back on track with Renesmee, and hopefully we can all agree what the fuck was going on here. If anything in the last book felt like a story arc Hail Mary that made no sense unless you were really in the loop on what was going on in Maya's head. Big hint, it's still Mormon shit. It's been Mormon shit every other time I've done this bit. And I don't know how many more times I can get away with making this joke, but I'm going to push my luck. Because the whole pregnancy arc with the abortion allegory and then Renezme leading into the getting all the vampires together and the Volturi being scared off was not really hinted at in any way up to this point. 
not even in the magical visions of Alice, which is probably because we get told later that she can't sense the future involving half vampires, because reasons, mostly, I have to presume, revisionist ones. See, what was built up, and what we did get in some form, was Bella finally, fine fucking Lee, becoming a vampire, after hundreds of pages of dragging that shit out to taunt the audience, I guess. And the shapeshifters being annoyed about someone being turned into a vampire, and the Volturi, the big bad villains, hovering in the background since the second book slash film to make their move, and bring their full force against Carlisle who he knew they felt threatened by and wanted to steal powered vampires from him. A little bit like a Magneto and Professor X situation. And no, no, the X-Men comparisons need to stop. These are the peaks that we've been building towards, especially after Victoria got murked in the last book. And Bella committed to that whole marriage thing, finally resolving the other threads, such as the first group of bad vampires that hated Bella, and the love triangle, who will she pick between Jacob and Edward, that honestly, like, we've already covered, never really felt like a proper race or competition. But then, into this mix, a pretty clean mix that could have some really solid connotations on the story, you know, Bella finding out what it's like to be a vampire, and then all of us seeing the Cullens have to seriously contest with the Volturi, who could just make up some charges against them to justify the conflict, built around the whole them allying with and working with those shapeshifters, which is actually something one of the Volturi does take umbrage with, and compares those people to werewolves, which... Yet again, as we mentioned, do not have a good history of vampires in this world building, and there is much animosity there, so those charges could have been used to really emphasise this story of like, ah, oh, the Cullens and the Shapeshifters and their friends have to fight the Volturi because the Volturi are just going to kill them and they can't make them go away, and Bella needs to learn about what being a vampire is like in this dangerous and fraught time. Into this is thrown the expected sex scene, with the expected bruising, but then the unexpected, Edward Seaman apparently still working. And the Venom doesn't kill them or stop his body from producing cum, I guess. Which raises so many more questions about vampire biology. Because we know that vampire wombs don't work, they don't produce eggs and are a hostile environment, but like, semen doesn't stick around forever, which means that those balls still gotta be producing. God. I miss talking about Harry Potter. Wait, no, scratch that, I, I don't. I'd take vampire genitals any day of the week. But, like, how do those balls produce sperm? Because, like, sperm doesn't just exist by itself and stick around forever. Like, it needs to constantly be getting made. And it's even weirder because while it is canon that vampire replaces all the bodily fluids in a vampire's body, and therefore it acts as a form of seminal fluid that can transfer the sperm to a human ovum, although then the question becomes, how the fuck does that work? But also, like, that still doesn't explain the sperm. Nothing explains the sperm. The only thing I can think of is that the sperm is frozen in time with the rest of the body when they become vampires, which doesn't necessarily make sense, but let's go with it. And then Edward is just injecting this preserved sperm from the Spanish influenza into Bella. Which also means that in that headcanon, we have to consider that Edward has not only just not slept with anyone else, which is true according to what we know about the big old mopey loner who clearly listens to My Chemical Romance, but also that he hasn't jerked off in a hundred years. That Mormon meme just keeps growing stronger and stronger, huh? Anyway, we then get to deal with watching a horrifying pregnancy that stretches over half the goddamn book and most of the film and really makes you just wish that she would take that abortion. But no, 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 there is a life kicking in there and this is an anti-abortion film because of course it is. And then Renesme comes out and triggers the whole horrifying imprinting implication that we will get to, I promise. Actually, let's get into it a little bit right now, because I want to briefly talk about Nahuel, the other vampire-human hybrid who comes by us to deus ex machina and stop the cool fight from happening, because that seems like the job of everybody in this godforsaken franchise. Everyone is just working towards making sure that we as the audience don't get to see a cool fight. And how Bella and Edward talk about the way that when Renesmee, a 
literal current baby who is barely like a few months old, when she comes of age, that Nahuel might be interested in making her his mate because she is similar to him. And that at least Jacob will have some competition when the time comes, am I right? There'll get to be another like little freeway love triangle between this current child, the man who imprinted on her, and this other adult man. Me and my friends discussed how this was literally like Maya setting up another love triangle for this child with two grown adults before ending the franchise. And if it turns out that she's actually writing this, we need to stop her. If it if it becomes apparent that Stephanie Meyer is going to release more Twilight books and they're going to focus on Renezme and these two adult men who've been, I guess, pushed towards being into her since she was a literal fucking child, someone needs to stop that. We're in a real delicate place in human society right now, and I honestly think such a thing might just end us. Also, she's the whole reason that the Volturi come, because they are get given the excuse of killing an eternal child, i.e. the name given to a child who is turned to a vampire, which is considered a bad thing because children can't control themselves, and so they need to get put down, and then that's that. It also gives Bella the whole perfect vampire family thing that screams Western family unit. Marriage, pregnancy, child, and house all in like three months. The unattainable boomer Christian dream. And you might be wondering why I haven't really talked much about Renezme herself as a character. Part of that is because Renezme not only inherited parts of her parents' powers, she also seemed to inherit Bella's incredible power of existing mostly as a means by which the narrative gets moved forwards and as something for other people to build their identities around. Giving Bella her hot new development of protective mother. She's now up to like five character traits, so... Good going, Maya. Renesme does have some stuff about being curious on the world. But she, like, learns too fast to exist comfortably, and suffers the same perfection syndrome that infects a lot of the people to the degree that almost everyone in the Twilight franchise is a Manny Stronzo or Melwyn Sonny, or whatever the fuck that stereotype is called. It's, it's on the tip of my tongue, I, I swear, I, I'm so close. And the story would honestly probably have been better for a lack of Renesme in it. It would have let Maya focus more on the interesting stuff, like the battle and the Volturi, and the vampire politics, all those vampires that turn up to help. Like, all of them could have a lot more scenes of doing stuff that give us a better insight on them, rather than pained abortion symbology about a baby that should not have been allowed to live. And also, that abortion metaphor is weird, because this is one of those cases where it's not like Bella is unprepared, or that it's an accident. It's like actively killing her and giving birth to this baby will make her dead, and they might not be able to vampire her in time. Like, this is the nightmare birth that abortions are 1 billion percent super justified in the case of. And I want to make it very clear right now, I am pro-abortion entirely in, like, any situation. If you just don't want it, that's fine. Just get rid of it. I, I don't see why I should care about you wanting to do that to your body. That seems like a perfectly reasonable and sensible choice. And I can't see any but the most evangelical Christians going, nope, abortion is still bad, even here where the mother is going to get murdered by the baby. But yeah, Renesme really does contribute to almost all the worst things that people cling to in the final book slash film. And the only reason that she really exists is not because she serves the story of the characters, but because Maya clearly wanted to shove that story in there, and God help the poor narrative and writing that was not equipped to handle that kind of allegory. So, the bad vampires is obviously the category where we get to talk about the vampires who are portrayed as the villains of the piece, in contrast to the good vampires that we are meant to be rooting for because they mostly don't want to eat us. Now, this is a tricky one because Stephanie Meyer actually says in an interview with Shannon Hale, included at the front of the Earthly Guide to Twilight, she doesn't think of any of her vampires as being villainous by nature that she wanted to portray them as not inherently evil, that all of them made a choice to do what they do, and that free will plays a role in the actions that they engage with. This is actually a really interesting comment, and something that I do agree with coming across in the books. 
that through the actions of the Cullens, we see that anyone in the vampire community, with the right amount of restraint and the desire to do so, could stop eating people. However, this concept fails a little bit when we dig deeper and remember all those powers that we talked about. The powers that let the Volturi mind control and push people to doing exactly what they want them to do, which does kind of leave the free will element a little bit drastically missing for anyone on that side of the conflict. A lot of these evil vampires might not have chosen to be evil, it's just that one or two really evil vampires with very good minions have pushed them into this life that they cannot escape from. And on the other side of that, our resident good vampires who choose the lifestyle that is definitely more ethical from a human perspective at least, don't really put in any effort to try and convince others to do what they are doing. Like, they have loads of friends who are all red-eyed and totally okay with murdering people for food, and surely Carlyle's immense compassion would push him to want to try and change vampire society for the better, be like an actual counterpart to the Volturi, as vampire supremacists, and that could have led to an interesting conflict between ideologies in the final book of the series if Carlyle had been built up like that and to fill that role, rather than the Volturi just coming down on him because he has lots of vampire friends and it all being mostly because of Bella or Renesme in some degree. He doesn't threaten the way of life, he merely threatens the current ruling power, he doesn't even do that on purpose, they just feel accidentally threatened by this guy who has barely done anything except just make friends around the place without espousing any particular belief system. I'm sure there are plenty of fanfics that do this better, and unfortunately we just can't talk about them because any attempt to discuss fanfics is going to push us closer and closer to a place that we cannot come back from, a discussion about something that we cannot allow to be discussed. It... I can't mention this. We can't. We can't do it. It's too... It's, it's, it's too bad. It's too wrong. And on that regards, I don't know how seriously to take the Stephanie Meyer quotes in the guide, because she also says in there that she didn't do any research on vampires at all for the books, except for the exact amount of research that Bella did, which I mean I guess she talked to a white dude pretending to be an indigenous person, and then searched pale ones in fake Bing for like two hours, which that's actually... That seems about accurate to Twilight, so I would believe that. And that she did this so that she could create vampires who were totally different to the normal conception of them. But that's not a great idea. I would 100% advocate that anyone looking to write a book about a commonly used trope or creature to look up in depth that creature and see how others handle it, because the best way to develop what themes work for those vampires and match their existing concepts and then to craft your own from that understanding is like the most efficient way to do things. Because you already are not coming into this with a clear mind. I mean, Maya said that she wrote Twilight because she was inspired by My Chemical Romance, something that we're going to get into in her own chapter. And she's also clearly engaged with Anne Rice vampires and also the other classical presentations of vampires. She's not coming into this completely blind, and neither would anybody. You already know stuff about vampires and have read stuff about them, so it just seems really arbitrary to then forbid yourself from doing extra research to, like, improve the books, or to understand allegories or symbology that is tied up with that creature in other works. It's it's honestly why, and I think we'll probably mention this a bit more, it's why I feel like the bad vampires don't have much to talk about them, because they don't represent anything. While the good vampires do have some things that they're clearly showing, I think the biggest thing being Mormonism, the bad vampires are just bad people. They don't represent corruption, they don't represent an oppressive system, they don't represent a even biblical evil. They're just bad people who are doing bad things and are the antagonists in the story. And that's kind of it. Which is really weak for any narrative. You want to have some sort of themes driving people to sort of look at it deeper and analyse it. I, well, you don't need to, I guess. Twilight was very successful having to do that, so... But it's nice. So that's going to be the conclusion for this. It's nice to have good writing. 
Anyways, I believe that we're supposed to be talking specifically about the bad vampires. The bad vampires who choose to be bad and evil and represent badness. Like I said, we'll talk about it more, we've already done that, but you'll see what I mean. In the first book, the bad vampire is, of course, James, the aforementioned tracker and creepy guy who stalks Bella because he wanted a piece of that curious meat, and who also tried to eat Alice too, a fact that I keep forgetting when I rewatch or reread the series. It's definitely mentioned in there a few times, but it went right over my head every time. James is kind of just a classical vampire. A predator who hunts down pretty much only women, and who prides himself on his tracking capabilities and his obsession towards catching his prey and never letting it get away, which is what draws him to go after Bella when she gets his interest. He then proceeds to trick her into coming to him with that lure of her mother's voice, and then beats the shit out of her for a bit before he then bites her and gets his own ass beat and burned by the Cullens turning up. And that's it for James. His whole deal, realistically, is setting up the bad vampire Victoria coming back in future entries to try and get revenge. And I think it actually would have been more interesting in this franchise if Bella had been vampirized by James in this situation, and then have the rest of the franchise with her as a vampire coming to terms with that, with her turning being not an act of help or saving by Carlisle or an act of love through Edward, but an act of violence and unwilling forcefulness that is almost a sort of violation by this person who is then killed. But that's by the by, because it it doesn't happen. James in the books and James in the film are pretty much the same, honestly, except that film James seems to collect elements from those he kills, such as wedding rings and Wayland Forge's jacket, the poor fisherman that gets murked very early on and makes everyone else think that there's a bear going around doing this stuff like there's the cocaine bear from that film. James doesn't really have much else going for him except for this. They don't really teach us much about the vampire world or give us a unique insight into how vampires operate, except for the fact that the mates can be quite close as we see Victoria come and try to kill Bella in the future as a mate for a mate exchange in her eyes. Though we discover from Edward that James never really loved Victoria and was just fascinated with her innate escaping abilities and saw his taking of her as him claiming her life some real possessive shit for a real possessive douche. This quite naturally brings us to the next bad vampire I want to talk about, Victoria. She makes some vague appearances in the second book, mostly just to sort of be around and give the shapeshifters something to chase after as she is tracking Bella to get that revenge that we mentioned earlier, though some things do raise a few questions. She is listed as the main antagonist of New Moon, But I honestly don't believe that, as she barely does anything except for be around ominously in the background and spook Bella that one time in the water. Like, seriously, there are non-stop clips of her just being around and looking at things for most of the film, and the end of Twilight, and she doesn't really take off as a villain who does something till she makes her newborn army in Eclipse and brings the fight against the shapeshifters and the Cullens. Even then, her motivations are still purely just revenge, and we don't get much information through her from that. We get even less of a sense of who Victoria is than we do with James, because she doesn't seem to really exist separate from her motivation of his death. She acts more as a catalyst to force the shapeshifters and the vampires to work together than as a villain in her own right. And that's unfair to her, because she does have a history that is, yet again, pretty fucking heinous, but could absolutely have been worked in in some form. Being a young, abandoned child whose sister worked as a sex worker in the 1500s and kept locked up by a pimp, and then her sister vanished and she was left on the streets until her sister returned, and her sister was a vampire now, and then her sister turned her into a vampire to try to make them both strong enough to survive in a hostile world that had mistreated these two young girls... And then the Volturi turned up and slaughtered her new coven and her sister, so she abandoned connections entirely because, you know, those were just getting into trouble, until James tracked her down and made her his mate. 
yeah, that was all actually a surprise to me, and not something that I think was really covered by the film at all, and was barely covered by the books, was that idea that Victoria was not turned by James, and was, if anything, actually older than James, and had a whole history long before he came into the scene. It would have been cool if that backstory had made its way into her character somehow, but, you know, bang, head gets pulled off, and she's gone forever now. Don't think about Victoria again. She provided motivation for the shapeshifters and the vampires were together, and she also provided motivation as a narrative to learn more about Jasper and his background with newborn armies and the whole southern wars, which sound very cool, but have, like, one paragraph on them in the guide, so there just isn't much to talk about there except vampires fought each other in the south with big armies made from newborns and Jasper was the general for one of those. That's that's kind of the whole paragraph. It's it's both upsetting and kind of alright that they just didn't go in depth into it. Although, with a guy, you probably should go more in depth. Like, in the books, fine. You don't need to go in depth for that thing. But the official guide has an excuse, I think, to do more lore dumps because it's a guide, not a book. Anyway, Victoria feels like a very underutilised character. One who could have done a lot more if the Twilight story had maybe just abandoned that whole love triangle that Stephanie Meyer had never really planned on putting in the first place until her publisher told her that they wanted more Jacob. I don't, I don't care for Jacob. I'm sorry. I just think that removing Jacob and allowing all that time to be spent on making the villains more interesting would have been better. Our final villainous bad vampires are the really interesting ones. The ones who give us a lot more knowledge about vampire society, and they are the current ruling class of the Volturi, and more specifically the members of Arrow, Caius, and Marcus. The rest of them are also bad vampires like Jane, but they're not that interesting. They're just, like, evil sadists who like hurting people, and work for the biggest dogs in town because that lets them do what they love doing while also getting protected for it. They are nothing without the power structure set up by these Volturi, and the Volturi really move into a main villain status in the last half of the last book, existing more as a threatening background group until then. We do meet them in New Moon, as Edward is going to use their desire to keep the vampire world secret as part of his suicide plan, and we see also how they desire Alice and desire powerful vampires to maintain their control over the rest. And we learn in later books slash films that the Volturi will fabricate claims against big covens, or so it is suspected, to shut them down. They're honestly a really good villain. These organisations that abuse power and fear to keep the populace spread thin and thus inclined to speak out or work together as the punishment for doing so is ruin. I can get behind that. It's just unfortunate that it doesn't fucking go anywhere. The failure of the Volturi to really deal with the Cullen's Coven is a fantastic setup for a real showdown at some point. But it's the final fucking book, and that's the last goddamn thing that we see happen with them before it just rushes straight into happily ever after, goodbye, get out of here. The Volturi feel like they should have been a lot more present, and that there should have been a lot more of them afterwards because they are set up and made to look really fascinating to us as an audience, and then it just doesn't really resolve. But as to the individual members of this coven, the three of them are ancient vampires in comparison to all the rest that we meet, having begun their climb to the top of the vampiric world in the days of the Roman Republic, and eventually toppling the old Romanian overlords, as we are told by the few survivors who show up to help the Cullens fight the Volturi. And there's actually a really cool thing there that they do with the Volturi that is a reference to their Roman heritage, which is the triumvirate that they are mimicking, a common alliance between dictators in the periods of unrest of the Roman Republic that saw these powerful figures come together and work with each other, ultimately knowing that they're going to betray the other if power dictates that they should. And we get some of that infighting sense already from the guide mostly not the books or films too much, as we learn that Arrow killed Marcus's mate Didymi as part of his plan to remove distractions for one of his strongest tools, ultimately failing as Marcus merely becomes withdrawn and reclusive. 
it's interesting political machinations and wheels turning that yet again you don't really get to see in the film but it's fascinating that we don't know that that happened because we still get this scene of Marcus being happy that he gets killed that doesn't make a whole heaping of sense without that context of like the fact that he's a miserable guy who wants to die but like Arrow won't let him. It, it just looks like the guy wanted to fucking die for no reason, which was a hoot and a holler for me and the rewatching party when it happened in the fake dream fight sequence. It also made me look up why Marcus acted like that, and it put me on track for making this whole video because I realised there was a lot of stuff that we just didn't know about. All of these political intrigues that are honestly quite good, and all these Volturi histories which are also pretty fantastic because they lend a lot of weight to the world and provide us with an idea of how vampire society is controlled by this small group of individuals who have centred power in a fascistic way around themselves and focus their efforts purely on the maintaining of that power, all of that is pointless because it doesn't really get served by the narrative or exist in it at all. It is more of a side distraction, and something to lend a credible sense of obstruction to the happy ever after, so we can feel as if the heroes overcame and achieved, but they didn't really do anything. Nothing really happened, and the tenseness makes it seem as if we really should be expecting a sequel of some kind to this Cold War-esque resolution at the end of Breaking Dawn. But that's all we have to work with. By this point, I'm hoping that you can see my issue with the villains of the Twilight series, the issue that I brought up earlier, the big problem that I have with them. It's not that they are boring, far from it. I think they're actually probably more engaging than the protagonists, and do often create a real hostile difficulty that is quite interesting for an audience to watch. The issue is that I don't really understand what they are meant to represent for the most part. And that comes across in the portrayal and the resolution of their stories. It feels as if there is a lot of potential here, a lot of options of what could be done to give us as an audience an idea of how to reconsider the vampires and to be invested in what comes next. But then what actually comes next doesn't really seem to care about what was set up. The build-up and the payoff are at odds with one another. And that is the kind of thing that can ruin even a good villain. The villain needs to be established, needs to be made into something that we feel is a problem, is a credible issue that represents some kind of flaw or obstacle and is often an allegory or a metaphor for a bunch of themes that we can relate to, and then we see the protagonists deal with it in a way that responds to those themes, that either gives us the sense of a problem resolved or a problem spun into a different angle. This does happen, of course, in the Twilight series. But it's all very surface level. It's all very much just that they are what they are, and it feels like it's more just something to get in the way of the main romance plot than woven into it. The problem seems to be that we need something to drag the book out, and here's the solution, and the solution also leads to more problems designed to drag the book out. I've done literary courses, and so I have to apologise for this getting a little wanky, and I hope that the point I wanted to make got across here. The villains are fine, it's just that they're underutilised by the plot, and the same is honestly true of a lot of the characters as well. The guide made it very clear that a lot of them have some really interesting stuff going on there that just doesn't make it to the books that were written before it. And every time backstory is brought up, it's not serving the character as much as it is just serving to try and advance the plot one more chapter. I just don't think that Stephanie Meyer is a great writer, and this is one of the clearest examples of that to me. Aha! I tricked you. They aren't really werewolves at all. They're shapeshifters, based on a white woman's not great appropriation of the culture of the local Kilyuk tribe. You already knew that, and I'd already made that clear throughout the video already, so shit, the big reveal doesn't work for the chapter. 
Let's just talk about the really not okay way that Stephanie Meyer wrote these shape changes into the narrative, and there are a lot of really not okay ways that this one goes, so we'll just take it step by step. The first is that aforementioned cultural appropriation, a big one that seems to keep fucking happening with these writers when they look at a place they're writing about and go, oh, huh, look at this, there are some indigenous people here. I wonder if I should type up their history and nick stuff from it without bothering to discuss with them if what I'm doing is okay, or even actually an accurate translation of these very real people into my fantasy world. Like, this is the second brief look, and I've only done two, where this has happened, and I guess Stephanie Meyer would be happy to be put in the same sentence as J.K. Rowling, but this seems like one of the worst ways that could occur. This is a tricky one to really dig into, though. Because when we consider the impacts that can occur from someone looking up another group's traditions and cultures online and then just sort of gutting it and mixing it with some weird interpretations of shapeshifting and werewolves from a more western perspective, and especially one inspired by later versions of werewolves in popular culture, I'm not really affected at the centre of this. I am one of those white people who can't really comment on what this means to me personally, because that's not my culture that has been used like that. The best I can really offer here is providing sources from people much closer to the issue, and as far as the Quileute tribe itself goes, the actual group of people who didn't just inspire the Native Americans found in Twilight, but are literally the group gutted and planted in there name for name, which is a much more dangerous tactic for inserting cultures, because you're not really giving yourself any space for flexibility in the fantasy portrayal of these real people. But as far as this community goes, the best information I can find on them is references to the way that they saw increased tourism and a transformation of the way that they advertised their culture to incorporate Twilight references into it. Something which was apparently upsetting to members of the tribe, but also brought in more cash flow for those people and helped to pay for stuff like college or other essentials. Which, like I said, this is a difficult one to really get into because it's not my place to tell any of these people that they are wrong for doing something like that or for treating their culture that way. I mean, shit, money is money and the system we are stuck living in really does make it a necessity for doing a lot of stuff. So I get that. But I also understand the other side in that argument who see this adjustment of their heritage to factor in some random white ladies made up crap about their culture, a bunch of made up crap that sort of takes some of their legends and tales and then twists it to not be that recognisable at all anymore, I can see how that could be upsetting. I can see how that might also be infuriating, as Stephanie Meyer didn't involve any of these indigenous voices in the crafting of the novel and the people instead relying on her own distant research to establish it after picking forks because it was a very rainy place in the United States. There was a whole website called Truth vs. Twilight, hosted by the Burke Museum, and in collaboration with the Quileute tribe itself, that really dives into the way that Twilight continues a consistent theme in Western media of crafting these Native American representations that are not accurate and that are harmful to the perceptions of an audience who will find that as their main reference point, more than any real and accurate portrayals of a culture and group who has suffered from intensive imperialism, exploitation and genocide. It's a story that replicates over and over again in the treatment of these people by Western governments and Western media, and that doesn't make it okay to do it as well because it's happened a bunch before. I would advise checking out that site, and also checking out a few more of the links that I'll be providing below the video in that section to better educate yourself. And I want you to keep all this in mind as we move through the rest of this chapter on the shapeshifters. And that shapeshifter werewolf joke from before was because they might as well just be werewolves. Because to everyone I know, that's what they called them. And they think of them as just a creative interpretation, much like the vampires are not quite like the standard vampires that we know. That's probably the best that I can say here, 
And anything else would just be talking for and over people who have had that happen to them so much already. So I want to avoid that. Let's move on to a different point about these shapeshifters. The point about the domestic abuse and the way that the franchise almost excuses it in the interest of serving romantic love. Yeah, some really heavy shit in this chapter, huh? You thought that Stephanie Meyer was gonna get away without really bumming us all out, cause, you know, foolish you if that was the case. The central characters to this discussion are that of Sam Ule, the alpha of the shapeshifter pack throughout most of the series, and his partner Emily Young. We see a fair bit of Sam, and we see Sam in a lot of the New Moon scenes that tell us how the shapeshifters have an issue with anger and with aggression causing them to wolf out and attack people. This is also tied up into how turning back into a human revolves around calming yourself and sort of meditating once more. A lot of this is built into the thematic nature of shapeshifting in Twilight as being very similar to werewolves in a few franchises as a metaphor for puberty and having this changing body and rush of hormones and emotional control issues. And werewolves are like a horror version of that designed to emphasize the worst parts to create fear for teenagers in horror. But then we also meet Emily Young later on in New Moon, an attractive young woman according to the writing whose face is marred by these massive scar lines, scar lines that are caused by Sam blowing up and attacking her. Now, how this happened definitely makes it worse, because you see Sam imprinted on Emily, that weird thing that they do where they basically have this one person become the centre of their obsessive little world, and they will do anything to be with them. So Sam had basically come around to Emily over and over again, even though she told him to go away and rejected his attempts to be with her. This went on until one day she made a comment about him being just like his father, who abandoned his family when Sam was young. So Sam walked out and damaged her so badly that the cover story they had to use was that she was attacked by a fucking bear. I guess that cocaine bear that seems to be going around the place in Forks and just uh, brutally murdering people. She mentions how, when she was lying in the hospital, she realised that she felt incomplete without Sam, the guy who badgered her for months and then violently slashed her face, and so she decided to say screw it and just be with him. And then she becomes like the character that we see in the background who does all the mum shit for the pack, cooking and making sure they are clean and getting them clothes, because women have a one goddamn no thing they do in this bloody franchise, find man, get married or engaged, become either literal mother or basically mother, and then just be fucking happy with it. The fact that this is portrayed as a good thing, that imprinting is just how things are, and that Emily just needed to accept her place as the wolf girl, as Bella calls her, and come to terms with the consequence of being the centre of affection for a supernatural dude who could kill her at any point, is messed up. You might be thinking to yourself here, holy shit, holy shit, what the fuck? Is, is that really the whole point of these characters? And yeah, it, it sort of is. They are engaged and they stay together throughout the entire thing, and it's sort of meant to be used as a parallel to Bella for her to see how she looks to others, and to learn to accept it just like Emily did. But maybe in truth, neither of them should accept this. Maybe it's okay to be with a partner who isn't obsessed with you due to some weird bullshit like imprinting or that your blood sings to them, and that you can just feel safe in a relationship with them. Just a thought. It, it doesn't seem like a good message to deliver to an audience of teenage girls that these are the protagonists and the romances that they're coming to just be like, well, this is my life now. Our next bit that I want to talk about with the shapeshifters is, is the imprinting. Because we touched on it just then, and we have touched on it as a reference a few times, and it's another one of those really terrible things that I do not understand why Stephanie Meyer wanted to put it in. The imprinting by itself is just really creepy, and buys into this interpretation of relationship and romance that is very one-sidedly aggressive, as the other person in this connection doesn't necessarily imprint in return, 
they're able to not be into it like Emily was with Sam until Sam, I guess, wore her down until she couldn't see herself without this stalker beside her. This whole thing feels very 80s, very 80s romance, and a lot of those films are very creepy in retrospect. But our main key point for imprinting being so much worse than this is of course the Jacob imprinting on Renezme that occurs within Breaking Dawn, a choice that I think was made specifically so that Jacob could have a happy ending with Bella becoming a vampire and ending up with Edward instead of him. Like it's a gimme for any of the Team Jacob people who were worried that he would end up with nothing at the end of this. Although, one could argue that just because you don't end up in a relationship doesn't mean you've lost and that you could view a friendship as just as valuable, but that attitude in a romance like this is untenable. Men and women just being friends and that being shown as being as good as hooking up? <laughs> Not the sort of message we want to give people in this story. And so Jacob gets to imprint on Bella's daughter. and were given the insight as an audience that such an imprinting was the cause for Jacob being so obsessed with Bella in the first place, because deep down he knew that her daughter was going to be the thing that as soon as he saw her, his whole world would shift so that she was at its core. And as he made clear to Bella, it's, it's not pedophilic. He would merely be a guardian, a mentor figure, a big brother as she grows up, a close companion when she comes of age, and actually, yeah, probably, no, they, they sort of imply that when she's, like, finally grown up, they would absolutely hook up and end up being together in a relationship. But, 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 only when she's legally able to do so, so it's all perfectly... Legally above board. Now, you all might recognise this as not helping the problem that we're going to have with this narrative point, as that is pretty much textbook grooming, and everyone seems to know that's what it's going to be, and doesn't really have any massive issues with it. Bella seems more annoyed at them nicknaming her baby Nessie after the Loch Ness monster, which honestly, Jesus Christ, I would take it because Renezme is a hell of a lot more embarrassing. I'd rather be called Loch Ness monster than Renezme. Come on, Bella. Because it was her. From the beginning, it was Nessie who wanted me there. Nessie? You nicknamed my daughter after the Loch Ness monster? <laughs> And when I was thinking about this, I couldn't help but remember all the times those evangelical Christians in America turn out to have dated their very young and just turned 18 girlfriends or partners since they were children, and they were long-time family friends before that point, or like youth pastors. In fact, this has become such a problem that a common article theme is talking about how when Christians point to queer people as groomers, the real epidemic is actually sitting right in their own churches and religious organisations. It's just everywhere at this point. And my brain can't help but think this being portrayed as something okay and normal and a good thing, that it happens to one of our potential love interest characters, has uh, something probably to do with the religious background of the author, Maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe that's something that we're really going to have to sink our teeth into with the Maya chapter. Really, really going to have to tear right into that as we find out what's her deal and how that deal ended up leading to this massively popular franchise. Our final shapeshifter thing that I wanted to talk about is that of Leah Clearwater, the only shapeshifter who is female and whose ability to do so was a surprise to everyone making it very clear that this is an unnatural or unusual occurrence, 
and not something that was seen before. It's interesting to me for a few reasons. The first of it being that this is one of those cases of a woman existing in a male-dominated space, and there are not many of those in the Twilight series, so this is a great way for us to see how Stephanie Meyer writes that. So what does Leia have going for her that builds into this incredibly unique place that she holds? What character traits could maybe give us an idea of exactly how this very gendered thematic concept is meant to play out for us? Well, we know that she is Sam's ex-girlfriend, that aforementioned guy who severely disfigured his paramour, I guess is the nice word for all that, the one who not only dealt with him vanishing when he turned into a wolf, but also then him breaking up with her because he imprinted on her cousin instead, led to a lot of rage and bitterness towards the both of them in a pretty reasonable fashion for Leia, honestly. I don't really blame her for that But this anger, this increasing rage, is what we are told by the guide ultimately makes her flip out and transform into a wolf for the first time. Another weird fucking detail is that the act of her transforming, the fact that she is a woman doing it and not her male sibling, makes her father die from a fucking heart attack and also shocks her brother so much that he transforms into a wolf too. We see very much here that the wolf transformation is really tied up in anger or emotion, and it's not really clear which one comes first, whether being really angry or emotional leads to becoming a wolf, or having that ability to become a wolf makes you an irritable individual who has anger problems. I avoided really talking about it in the previous bits because I don't like how it comes across But this anger being tied to a cultural affect of an indigenous person that brings out their inner savagery, I hate that word, is a bit of a worrying theme for Stephanie Meyer to put in, especially because it's not one that is really expounded upon or given a different light for us as the audience to see it in. At best, it's just thoughtless, and at worst, it's kinda racist. We get a significant amount more perspective into Leia's life and her way of thinking in Breaking Dawn, when she becomes the main ally of Jacob in his formation of a second wolf pack that seeks to protect Bella and her pregnancy and all that previously discussed jazz. We see that her main motivation for this is that she doesn't want to be around Sam anymore, that she hates the fact that she's just the freaky wolf girl ex-girlfriend who is barely tolerated by anybody, and whose pain, an understandable pain considering all the circumstances, is ignored by her pack, who should really have her back. We also get from a discussion she has with Jacob that the whole wolf thing has stopped her menstruation cycle, and has possibly affected her ability to have children at all, which raises so many more questions for me about what she is meant to represent. Is it meant to be like a commentary on femininity and how what we think of as femininity is often tied to the roles that we play and that being forced out of those roles is something that can cause great difficulties in identities? Is she meant to be a trans something? I honestly don't know. It feels like she's just sort of an angry woman and also because of the fact that she's in a male-dominated position, she can't possibly have kids, the ideal woman thing in the Maya world. It, It continues my belief that Maya just writes things sometimes, and then keeps writing them, and doesn't seem to give a flying shit if it adds up to anything in the end. Which is infuriating, because it means that I keep digging to try and find more, and the right answer for a lot of these characters might be that they are just what they are, that my digging is a frivolous and pointless activity that's leading us nowhere. Leia has struggles with her femininity, has struggles with her identity as a wolf caused by her anger over her life and the puberty that she goes through, who has difficulty with coming to terms with how her uniqueness means she has no answers with regards to if she can have children, or if she can do that imprinting thing. And there is so much in there, that speaks to me as like maybe being related to a bunch of different things from women who have those growing pains with their identity 
and how it relates to the expectations foisted upon them to it being a commentary on gender and trans people's connection to those gendered concepts. And yet all I can truly say for certain is that it isn't really any of those. It is just character dressing for character dressing's sake. It would be fantastic to have a book from Leia's perspective, or to have chapters from her perspective that let us really get to grips more what the themes and analogies from her very, very particular position are. That, that's, that's all I'm asking for. That's probably enough talking about shapeshifters. I know it's a lot less than we talked about the vampires, but the main reason for that is because there just is a lot less interesting stuff to talk about, unfortunately. I mean, we could do a bit discussing how there is apparently an alpha voice that the alpha wolf of the pack can use to effectively command others in such a way that they cannot break as long as they belong to that specific pack. But all that really tells me is that Maya has an understanding of wolf packs that is as mired in misinformation as all those pickup artists who espouse alpha hierarchies and those weird sexual dynamics. I mean, it's a bad thing. It's not very interesting or well written, but bad doesn't mean worth thinking about. I think you can just kind of ignore it and move to finally discuss the humans, and not just humans in how they relate to Bella and the vampires and the shapeshifters, but what we get from humans in defense of humanity, in their own way removed from what we have previously already mentioned. Alright, good talk. Happy we uh, got that one out of the way. Let's let's get back into the, the world that Stephanie Meyer created, the supernatural world for the Twilight franchise. When it comes to lore deep dives, one of the biggest aspects that you get to consider, that you get to have a lot of fun with thinking about, is all the additional tidbits that get added to flesh out the societies and the systems that exist around the characters that we're involved with. And when it comes to franchises like Twilight, the best parts for the viewers are obviously all the really stupid details that are infuriating or make no sense when we consider other information that we've been given or that work together to be, if anything, more distracting from the core narrative than additive to it. But Unlike the Harry Potter video, where lore was the core discussion point, I don't really have much here for you. Twilight is actually really sparse on these details, and more often than not, whatever we're told are minor comments that just sort of hint to fascinating stuff going on, rather than allowing them to take over in ways to distract from the story. There are no vampires shitting their pants and magically teleporting it away here, no Maya going on a blog site or Twitter and posting random facts and global history comments that are more racist or confusing than anything. Everything that happens is really condensed into the existing storylines, and mostly exists to provide some context to the characters. We know about the Southern Vampire Wars, when established vampire covens were challenged by their lessers creating newborn armies in the wake of the chaos caused by the Civil War, leading to a nuclear arms race of vampire creation that wiped out thousands of people and got blamed on a disease epidemic, and that this leads to the Vulturi coming in to maintain order before just fucking off and it sparked up again till the Vulturi came back, and then it sparked up when it left again a cycle of violence and repression that is apparently continuing to this day in the Twilight universe. All of that detail is used to give us history on Jasper, and to give us an understanding of how the Volturi operate, only really interfering on people breaking the unwritten vampire laws when it would threaten to expose them to humanity, or when someone would gain too much power. 
Both of those details are essential to the plot of Eclipse and Breaking Dawn, and we get told nothing more than that, no more details that would contradict or cause issue. Or what about the war between the Romanian vampires and the Italian vampires, which led to the downfall of the Romanians, and is the reason why humanity still has this concept of Dracula and Balkan origins from the early 1000s, because they were far less careful, and then got wiped out and had to go into hiding. It's information that is further used to cement the perspective that we have on the Volturi, as this ominous threat who's really taking power and is able to deal with these other strong vampires through their more subtle means. And I have no problem with any of this. Of course it really wounds my ability to waste 20,000 words talking about the intricacies of vampire society and how it makes no sense at all considering that it's set in our real world, but that's honestly a blessing in itself, because not every video has to be 10 hours long. And it's a blessing for Maya, because I do not think that she is a competent enough writer, or competently enough edited, to pull off that kind of effort. The sort of effort that one expects from those big fantasy novels that fuel decades-long franchises, and spend 10 years to write, and make you think that the author might just die before they finish. Instead, she focuses on a much more enclosed and detail-sparse perspective that gives the audience whatever little tidbits we require to get by with the story. And that's it. Because Twilight only exists for that book series and that film series, and it really does revolve around the central characters. Now, those characters are not, in my opinion, that good, but it's smart enough, or fortunate enough, to not build an additional castle of lore on such shaky foundations. To not try and craft a rich and complex world on a bunch of Google searches by somebody who then ends up deeming it good enough to then write their fictional vampire romance. It works because it doesn't try and be complex, and I'm grateful to it for doing that, because more people should be confident not pulling that kind of stuff. Not every story, not every creation, needs to be backed up by this massive amount of lore. If you want to turn it into a franchise spanning dozens of entries, yeah, you kind of do need to do that. But character-driven stories can sort of just push that to the side and rely on the audience accepting what you divulge and building the rest for themselves in their heads. If Maya started building more barriers around what we can consider to be true of the Volturi and the Romanians and the other vampires around the globe, then we start to see the holes in that description, but as it stands right now, it's pretty watertight, because we have to fill in the gaps ourselves with what we've got. Which is also certainly a very encouraging atmosphere to have for people to make fanfiction of it. Though I can't imagine anybody's making Twilight fanfiction, right? That, that'd be crazy. Twilight fanfic? Vampire romance stuff? On the internet? Unbelievable. But that's all I really have to say about the world. It's much more a story about the characters. So we should probably pull this all together now and talk about the person who wrote these characters and finally get some real-world context for what the fuck we've spent 30,000 words so far talking about. <laughs> now, as I've always maintained, and the reason why I think it is essential to consider a writer or creator in the discussion of whatever they have created, it's where such a thing is, in essence, a mirror. We can see a reflection of the beliefs and biases and ideology of the creator in what they create, and vice versa. So, to truly be able to understand Twilight, we do kinda need to be able to understand Stephanie Meyer herself, through her life and the other work that she has done. Now, her bio on her own site and what she presents in interviews is quite a tame one, mostly just focusing on the achievements of her book's success and on the classical story of a housewife who wrote a book in her spare time from looking after her husband and children, only to have it suddenly explode into overnight success and make her an icon of pop culture. 
This is one of those stories where, even if it's true, it feels so manufactured as to really ignore the interesting stuff about the author themselves. And the only real takeaway we can have from it is that Stephanie Meyer and her publishing company want you to focus on those elements. They want you to think about the books attaining such a status, and that relation to her relative anonymity beforehand. J.K. Rowling had a very similar thing with how the media spun her story as well, and it's meant to make the author seem humble, while also still representing the hope of hitting the big time to any aspiring writers out there. But Stephanie Meyer's story goes so much deeper than just she was a graduate with an English literature degree who married young and had kids and was a housewife until one night she dreamed a sexy vampire dream. And then BAM! Twilight. Although elements of that are actually already kind of deeper, you can see the English lit degree at work when you consider the way that she positions herself in regards to classical stories. And... It's also important to note that English Lit is not a creative writing degree. You can be very good at criticising or analysing pieces of creative fiction without being that good at making them yourself, a la, you know, look at me, through the way that she describes the inspirations of Twilight in the subsequent books. Obviously, there are the Shakespearean references, the classical one, of course, being Romeo and Juliet, but she also discusses the Merchant of Venice and the Tempest in that too. She also talks about Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre being stories that she mimicked in some way for the plot lines, and the character decisions of New Moon and Eclipse. It would be so simple to just dismiss her as a lazy writer whose research on various factors that she included was lacklustre and led to them being thematically devoid, but the romantic side of her writing has a rich history of inspiration. I don't think that it's fair for us to throw it aside so casually. The characters might not be the best, and the development might fail at appealing, but the actual narrative itself does have themes that one can see as being tied to those kinds of books that she's listing in her interviews. But of course, the thing that we're all here for is the Mormon side of things. The latter-day saints that I have kept putting off as a discussion until a latter day, but that latter day is finally here, and saints no way I can avoid it. Because religion did play a big part in the initial success of Twilight. The success before it became a global phenomenon. 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 Megan Tingley, the eventual publisher discussed in an interview how a big focus of the books was that it was erotic while chaste, horror while set in a Christian fashion, and with vampires who could appeal to Mormon fans, and the initial success found a lot of fans within those Mormon circles, where the appeal of Maya's own backstory led to them being interested in how she wrote it, and the fact that she was specifically advertised as belonging to that particular Christian sect. From the very beginning, the story was intertwined with her religion, and the ideology that goes along with that religion was heavily present in the books. And this is where I divert somewhat from the position that a lot of people would take here and have taken, moving straight on to just mocking what is a religion that most people have split from in the modern progressive world, due to the fact that a lot of its gender roles and views on abortion and elements have fallen out of favour with younger people. And I've done my fair share of dunking on Mormon and Christianity already, because you can't read Twilight or watch Twilight and not see those things present in the pregnancy storyline and its defence of not getting an abortion, and the way that motherhood becomes a central part of every female character's life, and they obsess over it and not having it if they're infertile or incapable like Leah or Rosalie, or in the marriage storyline where it's very clear that abstinence till after marriage is played as making it all the more worthwhile. And here's the thing. None of that is necessarily bad. There is nothing wrong with an author inserting their beliefs into their work. In fact, it's highly expected that it's going to happen. The problem comes more with an audience and the way that the audience who does not agree with those beliefs interacts with the work. Like how a lot of people reacted to the weird storylines going on in Eclipse and Breaking Dawn, and the honestly not very feminist interpretation of women's roles and male interactions romantically in those regards that we've already covered with 
mostly Jacob Black. That kid is really wrapped up in the worst stuff with, you know, the forced kissing and the friend suicide and the imprinting on a child that he is totally going to groom. But none of that is necessarily a flaw with being Mormon. It can be seen as a showcase of those religious ideologies and the way that they impact someone's interpretation of those features and I definitely think it's fair to consider that as being the main inspiring factor behind Maya because many people have faith as a central part of their identity. It doesn't automatically mean bad writing or bad stories is what I'm getting at here. And in the right audiences, I imagine that it doesn't even translate as creepy or ethically strange. But when people who don't share those beliefs are engaging with it, when it breaks into wider audiences like a book or film series that was one of the best-selling things of the late 2000s, and even succeeded in knocking J.K. Rowling off her throne, that's when other people with other belief systems start to get their hands on it, and analyse its plot points through less sympathetic lenses. I mean, look, I know all about that. I make these videos for a specific audience who will sympathize with my message and the posters that I have on my wall and my identity and my desire to shove hours of content into a single video. But at a certain point, a video goes past that audience and gets recommended to those who will dislike everything about what I have made. None of this here is about trying to say that Maya is a bad person or that being Mormon is bad. It's merely that using that history, we can understand how Twilight occurred the way it did a little better. Mormonism isn't even the only inspiration. As Maya recounted in a 2009 interview that the character of Jacob Black, his longing for a romance that could not happen, and whose youthful experience of love leads to him being kind of an obsessive creep, was predominantly inspired by My Chemical Romance and their song's famous last words and I'm not okay, I promise explicitly. The raw nature of MCR's pop, punk, goth vibe is something I can kind of see reflected in the series and in that character specifically. Even if MCR themselves wanted absolutely nothing to do with the franchise and with what they viewed as just chasing the money of the aesthetic that they popularised an aesthetic that they had been moving on from, and I respect that as a choice that one can make. And honestly, I'm kind of just happy that Paramore got involved with it instead, because Paramore's also really cool. Even if this was Paramore back in the days when the band still had a bunch of evangelical Christians in it, including one or two who really hated gay people and got moved out of the band for a very good reason, according to Hayley Williams. Paramore drama aside, and Actually, no, 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 you know what? Paramore drama of anti-LGBTQ stuff absolutely can serve as a lead-in for us here, because anti-queer shit is a classic of Christian-inspired work. And the fact that you put werewolves and vampires, especially sexy vampires, two groups who have often been used to represent minorities like gay people, in generally not so favourable ways, both of those people can be seen as a diseased outsider who infects others through their bite, with werewolves being more of a savage, animalistic version, and vampires being the seductive, corruptive, you know, upper-class version. Though those less-than-favorable ways did give queer-adjacent representations a chance in early cinema to exist, and also led to future interpretations that flipped that concept on their head. So it's kind of interesting to see a franchise that includes nothing pointing to that queer history at all. Everyone is straight as fuck in Twilight, and in fact they are so straight and so cisgendered as fuck that all the romance stuff is done with literal vampires finding a single mate and werewolves imprinting on a single person. It's annoying, and I 100% can see why a lot of queer people do fanfic for Twilight that tries to fix that, because this heavily Christian dominant one wasn't going to put in our stories, obviously. But this Mormon Western identity of Maya also digs in another direction too, with the claims by people of her racism around the vampire characters in their translation to the cinema. Catherine Hardwick, the director of the very first film, talked in interviews about how she attempted to change the cast to be more diverse, wanting Alice to be Japanese, and to change up their stories to give this more global perception of the vampires, 
but that Stephanie Meyer resisted these changes and refused to have any people of colour play the colours, saying that she wrote them to have pale skin explicitly, only relenting to allow the semi-villain of Laurent to be played by a black man. This difficulty in the argument between visions was apparently something that ultimately led to Hardwick being removed from the franchise as director, something that I do believe is a travesty because the first Twilight film is actually pretty decent, and the quality only really goes downhill from there. Maya also further confirms this paleness in the illustrated guide, where she doubles down seven years later on the fact that becoming a vampire bleaches your skin as it turns it impervious. And some people, myself included, have picked up on the way that this ties into the Mormon influences and the themes of the vampires. See, becoming a vampire is presented in Twilight as the ultimate end goal for Bella, and with Carlyle's redemption and his saving of other vampires from difficult or horrible lives, you can sort of perceive a vampirism as a metaphor for the family of faith that a lot of sects present themselves as. The founder of the Latter-day Saints, Joseph Smith, believed that people of colour would find racial redemption by converting to Mormonism, and the second president of the church, Brigham Young, taught his followers that all black people were descended from Cain, who was marked with that pigmentation as a curse for his murder of his brother, according to them at least. Obviously, insane. Using those sources, and considering the way that they fit into the narrative of Twilight, one can see this perspective of vampirism as redemption, as a process that bleaches your skin and gives you an eternal afterlife of happiness with a family and a partner and all that Christian jazz, and the way that the indigenous shapeshifter of Jacob attempts to distract Bella from this redemption and to have her be with him instead, all of it can be seen as having unfortunate roots in that racist Mormon history and influence. This isn't even an uncommon reading of Twilight's narrative among black communities and indigenous communities, especially in regards to seeing Edward as the paragon of whiteness and Jacob Black as the representation of the others outside of that white heavenly good imagery linked to the Cullens that Bella is trying to get in with. Yet again, this is not saying that Mormons are inherently racists or that Stephanie Meyer herself is a racist. Uh, I mean, it's not not saying that, and some of this stuff is probably actually pretty racist, but a history of racism in the foundation of religion that is used as the main source of influence for creation is gonna have an impact and filter its way into your work. Being introspective about that and considering that is a great way for a writer to save themselves from doing the not great stuff that Maya did in this regard. You know, any just a, just a just a clue there for any white writers who might be doing something similar. Maybe maybe think about that. And this brings me to the final point I want to make about Maya, and that I want to discuss with reference to others, and that is if she is a good writer, because she is certainly popular, but popularity does not equate quality. Just look at Logan Paul. Stephen King, a writer who absolutely has his own host of massive issues summarises my opinion on Maya quite well in an interview that he gave with USA a Weekend in 2009, saying that while he did not think that Maya was a terrible writer, he believed that people are attracted by the stories, by the pace, and in the case of Stephanie Meyer, it's very clear that she wrote to a whole generation of girls and opening up kind of a safe joining of love and sex in those books. A lot of the physical side of it is conveyed in things like the vampire will touch her forearm or run her hand over skin and she just flushes all hot and cold. And for girls that's a shorthand for all the feelings that they are not ready to deal with yet or that they've been told to suppress by society. And this idea of the audience that Maya was writing to appeal to is also apparent in the way that she based Bella on herself in regards to the whole Bella turning up at a new school and suddenly being the bell uh of the ball uh with all the guys wanting a piece of the new girl, saying that the same thing happened with her when she moved from high school to college. I think there's always this mix-up for people between appealing and good. 
Because you can write a very appealing book series that really connects with people and makes them care a lot about it. Me fucking included. I'm, I am this deep here because I rewatch the Twilight series once a year without it actually being of a high quality and being something that people can point to as using themes and allegories and conventions to deliver a well-crafted and intricate story. Those two things can very much exist separately. In the case of Maya, I would 100% believe that this is the case. She isn't a good writer, and The Host is another weird-ass book that made me convinced on that fact, but she definitely hooked people with what she wrote. But my notion of if she is good or bad is a subjective one, based on my reading and based on all this research I've done, but I'm not necessarily right. I'm not necessarily wrong either, but you might disagree and that's fine. You know, it's just that's how writing is. Oh, and briefly, while we touched on the way that Bella is inspired by Stephanie Meyer herself, a common thing that people often claim with the character and the narrative is that it's all just a big self-insert, and that Meyer is writing a character that she sees herself as, to a degree that it causes an unhealthy amount of focus on that protagonist. It's something that I definitely see as an issue with the books, and that I think influences the way that Bella Swan comes off as being this consistently sought-after paramour. And I think the funniest supporter of that theory, the self-insert theory, is Robert Pattinson, where he talks about the research he did for the film, and that he truly felt as if this whole thing was a sexual fantasy that ended up becoming an international sensation, with this fantastic line from him in an interview. When I read it, it seemed like... I, w I was convinced that Stephanie was convinced she was Bella, and uh, and you, it wasn't. It was like it was a book that wasn't supposed to be published, and you're like reading her, her sort of sexual fantasy about some. And especially when she says oh, it was based on a dream, and it's like oh, I've, met, I've had this dream about this really sexy guy, and she just writes this book about it. And like some things about Edward are so specific, and it's like I was just convinced that it's like this woman is mad. She's completely mad, and she's in love with her own fictional creation. And like sometimes you like feel like uncomfortable reading this thing. Honestly, hard to argue with that from some guy who definitely spent a lot of time around that author and her characters, enough that he would get that idea pretty well. So that's Stephanie Meyer, and we rambled a little bit here, and jumped around a fair bit more. But I hope that you understand now a lot more about the author, and about how she ties to her work. I hope that you can also see the ways that Twilight is both good and bad, a positive work of creation, and a fucking nightmarish one that incorporates the best and worst elements of authorial involvement with what you write. The best thing for it is honestly that it's over, because the first one was the most well put together, and the rest kept coming off as more of a shadow of that initial piece of work not really being necessary to the story, except for that publishers wanted to milk it, and Maya was happy to oblige. Wait, wait, why are we pulling this article? What does that article say? No. No, you're fucking kidding me. That's not a blessing, it's a... It's... You have to be kidding me. And they're apparently going to be digging into a whole new host of rules and mythology, because... Mythology is apparently Stephanie Meyer's thing? God, God no, it's a trap. It's a trap, Stephanie Meyer. You did so well because you didn't bother going so deeply into mythology. Because you didn't end up fucking yourself by writing so much extra mythology that ruined what you'd already made. Look, God damn it, why does this keep happening? Why do I keep making these deep dives and then there's a new thing coming out at some point soon? It's like, what? But whatever. It's time to end this video. We've covered all the essential stuff, we've dug through all the characters and the themes and the plot lines that anyone could possibly want to talk about with Twilight. And it's led to a significantly shorter video, thank God for that. But is it over? We can both see the timestamp, and you and I both know that there's a lot more to go. What? We're not done yet. But what could I possibly talk about? What more could I say about Twilight that I haven't already done? Ooh, exciting. Oh, 
Right, all those extra books that Maya wrote, the novella and the reimagining and Edward's perspective that I did my absolute best to just briefly reference and not do a whole goddamn chapter on. And yet, I read them all the way through a few times, and here we are, talking about them. Because if we're going to cover everything Twilight, we might as well just cover everything Twilight. And if I have to suffer through it, then you have to suffer through it too. That's the unspoken agreement of this video. Let's get the easiest, the shortest one out of the way first, and that is the Life and Death Twilight Reimagined book. That actually might have confused one or two of you, as the book itself is the same length as the normal Twilight book, and the short second life of Brie Tanner is the actually shortest book, but that one gives us new context and characters. Meanwhile, life and death is literally just what if main characters were gender swapped and had, if possible, sillier names. And it also feels abusive towards the word reimagined. Making Bella Swan Beau Swan, and Edward Cullen into Edith Cullen, and swapping the rest around too, and that's basically all it did. Or was that all it did? See, what I just described to you there is the gut reaction that I know many people have to Twilight Reimagined, and that has become the meme that gets made about the entry. A response that I myself had too, and that I was so confident in that I planned out this chapter to originally be a quick dunk on it. But the more that I read it, and the more that I engaged with the actual book itself, and the narrative that it portrayed, the more that I came to see it as a superior version of the original Twilight book. Having the characters be present in this different light, swapping the gender paradigms that lent an unfortunate area of stereotype originally in masculine dominance, by changing it up and giving the male protagonist an air of vulnerability and weakness that is then challenged by the strength and speed of the female vampire who is drawn in by his special shield and ability, just having Beaufort Swan and Edith Cullen written in the same ways that the Parallel Universe counterparts are already changes the game massively. It gives an entirely new perspective on those stereotypes and makes the characters all the more interesting for it. Rather than being tired old tropes that we've seen before in romance, it becomes something exciting and new that recaptured my attention. The book also changes one of the biggest things from the franchise, by having it so that at the end, Joss, the female version of James, succeeds in turning Bo into a vampire before he can be saved, as he has gone too far. This leads to an early confrontation between the Cullens and the Shapeshifters, a full two books before it happens in the normal one, and they clear the misunderstanding about this up really quickly. Because instead of Bo being transformed by a Cullen, a thing against the agreement, it was by some random vampire that they brutally murdered afterwards. Which just shows how easy it was to defuse the whole process if Bella had just gotten vampirized in the first one. She also wouldn't have had that whole fucking baby arc, and that would have been great for me never having to see that monstrosity of CGI high. <sighs> So it was fascinating to see how something that I had dismissed originally as not changing anything really in Twilight, or not enough to warrant caring about, actually did prove that even the most subtle of differences can have a massive impact, and that gender is something that really does shift and change drastically depending on who is presented in which situation, and based on our already existing historical interpretations of that. Pointing to life and death Twilight Reimagined itself as a great example of gender roles in writing is not what I expected to get out of this process, but from now on it will be something that I will do. And if you loved the original series or enjoyed reading it, but never really liked the way that characters are presented, then I can heartily advise checking out this book, because I'm pretty sure you'll really enjoy it. Our next insert from Stephanie Meyer is that of the short second life of Brie Tanner, a book that exists within the Eclipse storyline, and follows that young vampire that we get to meet in the film who's unfortunately murdered by the Volturi when they turn up super late to everything and just kind of commit to finishing up the rest of Victoria's newborn army in a sort of sinister manner that, that displayed that they were like, they weren't going to do anything until it was going to look bad for them. 
This is another book that is really good by the nature of it providing us an insight into the characters who barely existed in the third book, the newborns who were used more as a battering ram of danger than as something that we as an audience seriously considered or got to know about, as it tells us how they adjust to becoming a vampire in a much more hostile and cruel experience compared to the Cullens that we see otherwise. The newborns are lied to and manipulated by Victoria and her underling Riley, told that vampires die in sunlight and they can be killed by stakes, only to then torture and kill those who discover otherwise by pretending that they are out on missions. The newborns are kept in a state of fear and anxiety, the status as vampires used against them, and the knowledge that they can never go back to a human life utilised to turn them into the perfect army of willing slaves for Victoria on her revenge mission to get at Bella. I've just had this like weird analogy in my head when thinking about this to those people who are like brought into a country and given fake visas and are then basically exploited by that employer because they know that if they're ever revealed they'll be sent back like... I don't think that's intentional. I don't think that that was in any way, shape, or form what Maya was thinking, but... And ultimately, we see from Bree's perspective how the newborns are slaughtered. The people that she has come to know and love over the course of the shared punishment of a second life, eventually leading to her being taken by the Volturi and being killed right as she begins to see that some vampires can be good when the Cullens offer asylum for surrendering. It's another entry that does read better than the core books themselves, that does give us the dire and dark look at romance and love in a harsh place and without a warm environment. It also really reminded me a lot of 1984, which might come off as a weird comparison, but the romance between our main characters is shattered and damaged by a manipulative authority figure who uses fascistic rules and lies to control their underlings, and that led to some really cool ideas and concepts. It didn't add any information that we didn't already know about vampire society, but just flipping it so that we seriously saw what life was like in the newborn army is already a great enough premise that it works so well. It also gives us more context for seeing Victoria as this true, real villain, who leads and lies to everyone, and will do whatever it takes to achieve her singular last mission, devolved from the distraction of all the other werewolf crap and stuff that happened in New Moon and Eclipse. It really makes me wish that Maya had been more confident to write more of Victoria in as a point of view character as well, because POV characters are our best way as audiences to get an idea of villains or groups who are positioned as villains like the newborn army. Our final additional entry is Midnight Sun, another sort of retelling of Twilight, but this time in the main universe and done from Edward's perspective. This is the one that I have most referenced throughout this video so far because it gives us a lot of information about Edward and his perspective on Bella and the events that happened most notably being the reinforcement that he truly does see humans as children, as that much younger than him in every regard, which is kinda creepy that he lets Bella wear him down and allows the relationship to happen. Just because you resist it before you end up dating someone you consider a child doesn't make it okay. And the rest of the book that I haven't already discussed really does kinda ruin the character of Edward for me by a lot, because instead of being this edgy loner guy that we perceive from the outside, he's just a complete tool who is super dismissive of everyone and is internally a big old jerk. And part of that is probably to do with the fact that he has been through high school multiple freaking times at this point to maintain the illusion of being human, as we can see from that wall of graduation caps in the films. That's a lot of time on pretending to be high schoolers. But the illustrated guide also tells us that every single one of the vampires has degrees, and that because all of them are so close in age, they vary up the relationships whenever they move to a new place. So it's not like he needs to be in high school if he doesn't want to. Like, if he really hates it, he could just tell Carlisle, hey, I don't want to be in high school ever again. 
can we just have it as I am the older sibling who is studying or doing something else while staying at home, a not uncommon occurrence at this time period, the time of the American recession in the late 2000s? And the only reason that we get from Edward's perspective that such a thing hasn't happened is because he needs to be in high school for the plot to occur. It's more of a character not doing things in character to serve the plot, an annoying form of plot hole plain and simple, the creation of a problem whose existence is only justified by the need of the plot and not developed by other factors. In fact, if anything, Midnight Sun gives us a better view of the other vampires than it does of Edward, weird as that might seem. Because through his eyes and his mind reading, we get to see the struggles that each of them deal with in ways that are more removed from Bella's perfect perception of them. Which is a good thing, because in the main Twilight series, we were told more than shown how they had issues. Like, we never really got to see Jasper freak out except for when that literal blood showed up in New Moon, and it seemed like a real overreaction for the Cullens to just leave the country entirely for that. But in Midnight Sun, we understand that Jasper is truly, constantly having to hold back every second he is around people, and that he hates himself for it. It reminds me a lot of the disparity between the Buffy and Angel shows, a disparity that I am a big fan of in those series, where in Buffy we are seeing the character of Angel through the eyes of an infatuated teenager who views him as this dark and mysterious character that struggles with their life and wants nothing more than to redeem himself. And then in the show Angel, we see Angel as this complete buffoon who has massive amounts of social anxiety and doubt and struggles to do a lot of really simple things or has panic dreams and it's like, oh, this badass dude just seemed like a badass because we couldn't see things from his side. La Brea. Sounds like that could be uh, an evening with all sorts of evening type. I, I heard the bands there are. They don't have bands. Which, which I like because if it's too loud. You wanna come? Oh, uh, I think I may be busy. And that's honestly a really cool concept. The concept of flipping the way the audience sees characters on its head by giving us a view on their life from their eyes. Midnight Sun also continues to emphasize the strength versus weakness parallel between Edward and Bella in his narrative. Edward constantly talking about how he felt the desire to step in and protect her because of how vulnerable she seemed and how fragile she came across. We also get a view on that whole singer blood thing that we briefly mentioned earlier, as we see the description of when Edward first smells Bella as being that his whole world shifted and only her mattered, and the only thing that mattered was eating her, like a weird little mockery version of the imprinting, both of them causing the person in question to change everything about them to suddenly focus on this random person that they've just finally met, but with imprinting its obsessive obedience and loyalty and love like a dog. And with the singer, it's an obsessive need to consume, to become a predator and devour this prey, like a cat. We also see that for Edward, this singer thing led to him very easily considering how he had to obtain her blood, from murdering every single person in the room at the time so that there were no witnesses, and how he could stretch out the amount of time that he would get to suck Bella's blood, and like, reading that few pages made me think, holy shit, this sounds like some serial killer stuff how calmly he considered the plan of murdering all these people just to get to Bella and her red crimson liquid. And like, god damn, it is so much more different seeing Edward describe it in his own head versus Edward just say to Bella that he was going to kill her. Like, Midnight Sun, more than anything, makes me think that we needed a few Edward chapters in Twilight because it absolutely would have helped with emphasizing the danger and also giving us more of an insight on the vampires away from the outside view that Bella has. Maya seems to be a lot more competent at showing emotion and issue from inside a character's skull than portraying it from another's perspective. And so leaning more into varied POV chapters like Midnight Sun would have been a great way to fix that. I mean, I know that she started writing Midnight Sun when she was writing Twilight, as it started as an exercise to practice Edward's character out for the book, 
but should have wholesale gutted some of these chapters and shoved them into the main series. Aside from those moments and little useful tidbits for us to understand Edward in Twilight better, a lot of Midnight Sun is very unnecessary detail that I couldn't care less about and that you shouldn't care about either. The whole issue with Tanya from the other coven that Edward turns down, his various internal monologues that go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and take up a good portion of the book, these are not really good writing conventions, or not something that I think is designed to be interesting for the audience, and are why I think it would have been better suited as a singular few chapters that are spread throughout Twilight, rather than a whole 260 page separate book. Of course it gives us some background detail on Edward's life, but a lot of that we didn't need to know, or doesn't really matter to furthering the narrative, and we actually get the exact same thing from the Illustrated Guide, a book where that is more suited too. It could have functioned quite nicely as a blog post too, I guess, and I think that stretching of a perfectly fine piece of writing to be far too long and bogged down in tons of unnecessary detail is a consistent theme that I noticed with Maya's writing. It's part of why I do agree with Stephen King's assertion that she isn't a good technical writer, even if she might be very successful. I wouldn't advise reading Midnight Sun like I advised reading the other books here, as I don't really think that it provides anything extra that is worth spending all that time digging through it. Before we wrap up this chapter and this whole video essay, I know we're finally there. I just want to say a Stephanie Meyer quote from the Illustrated Guide that I think really encapsulates something I've always felt with pop culture, and it goes like this. Every book has its audience. Sometimes it's an audience of one person, sometimes it's an audience of 20, and every book has someone who loves it, and some people who don't. Every one of those books in a bookstore has a reason to be there, some person that it's going to touch, but you can't expect it to get everybody. And you can't say, well, there is something wrong if this book didn't mean the same thing to everyone who read it. The book shouldn't make sense to some people because we're all different. And you know what? Yeah. Yeah. I love Twilight as a series. I constantly go back to it, and I find it funny and weird and creepy in a lot of places, and downright silly in others. And the fact that I can name all the characters and talk about the entire plot off by heart, and yet still, my interpretation of it is going to be different to other people who love the series. I personally believe that if you really love something, you should be hypercritical of it, and introspective about what that means, and about what it represents to you, so that you can better understand why you love something. And I hope that in the course of this video essay that I've been able to keep this in such a way that other people who love Twilight have maybe thought about this a little differently. I hope that what I've said here and my discussion about the characters, because Twilight is frankly built for the characters. Other books are built for the lore, or built for the escapism, or built so that you can shove your weird linguistic skills and fake languages you made up in your spare time, you know, looking at you, Tolkien. But in Twilight, it's about the people, and how those people speak to us. And maybe I don't think they're well written, or that they're one note and could have been developed better, or that they maybe represent religious beliefs that I do not agree with. But they're still characters who hold a place in my brain, and a place in my heart and nothing is going to change that. It's a love-hate relationship, and I've learned to accept a long time ago that plenty of things that I love are just not good by any technical or professional standards of that word, and that's fine. It doesn't reflect worse on me as a person, it doesn't mean that I'm not a good person, and millions of other people are in the same boat. In fact, I don't think there's a single person alive who likes all the right and perfect and correct things, and that's a good thing. Twilight is flawed, but so are we, and that's okay. As long as we're aware of that fact, and we acknowledge, and we know what that means for us, and we're trying to improve while enjoying what we enjoy, that's okay. What a silly and wild ride it's been though, huh? I do really hope that you learnt something from this, especially maybe you learnt areas that you would change when you write fanfic about the series, because that's what I noticed when I was reading comments in the Harry Potter video. 
a lot of people who saw my brief look as a chance to make changes in a piece of paratext that exists to allow fans to engage with content further by adjusting it to meet their own desires and wants from a franchise that they love. Ah, fanfic. I'm sure there is something I'm forgetting here in the Twilight story about fanfic. It... I can, like, taste it. It feels dark and dirty and wrong and even weirder. But I... I can't quite place it. Unlike Twilight, it's, it's not black and white, clear shows of good and evil. It's... It's more like shades of grey. But how many shades of grey are there? Last I checked, it was... 40? 45? 50? 50 shades of grey? 50 shades of grey. Now, I promise we're not going to talk in depth about the plot of this nightmarish book and film series that is sort of a spin-off of Twilight in the loosest possible sense of that term. And that's because this is a Twilight deep dive. You want Fifty Shades of Grey shit, you can go and watch Folding Ideas or someone else. Instead, what I want to consider here is the relation this massively popular BDSM self-insert fetish series had on the perspective of fanfic, and its piggybacking success of Twilight. Because much like how it is impossible to consider all of Twilight without considering what inspired Maya to make it, it's also impossible to do so without considering what it itself inspired afterwards. And this is one of the most direct relations that one can possibly find. Fifty Shades of Grey is a book series by E.L. James that began its life as Masters of the Universe, and that does make it sound a lot like it's a He-Man fanfic more than anything, but I, I promise you it's, it's literally just a gutting of Twilight and swapping all the supernatural stuff for more mundane elements. Vampirism becomes being rich, wanting to drink someone's blood becomes wanting to BDSM them, and so on. I skim-read the original Master of the Universe, and I say skim-read because it's 1700 pages long, and it fucking sucks. There is a common trope for fanfiction that positions it as being bad because it's normally done by a bunch of people in blogs on fanfiction.net that have no creative writing history and are using it as a way of either expressing themselves or learning the tools of writing. And while this isn't necessarily true, there are plenty of really well-written fanfics out there. Tons of fantastic ones inspired by all the most popular franchises that seek to insert elements that are felt to be missing. It's also kind of true and fine that a lot of fanfics do suck. As I said, many of these are not meant to be finished pieces that are put out into the wider world, and that's why a lot of them are written under a pen name instead. I mean, Masters of the Universe wasn't written by E.L. James. It was written by Snow Queen's Ice Dragon. And the worst thing that I can find about the Masters of the Universe, instead of just what it is, is that when it came to adapting into Fifty Shades of Grey, they didn't change a whole lot, mostly just the names that they could avoid being sued into the ground. If you read the two pieces back to back, like I did, you can see that while they did fix a few things up and really sparse those chapters down, the overall vibe and the writing doesn't change at all. And that's a really fucking bad thing. Because its use of Twilight as a base for creating its identity, and combining that with the controversial notion of presenting BDSM, or at least an outside fetishist's view of what BDSM might be for the community if you haven't bothered to, you know, research it, and just base it off police procedurals from the early 2000s, all worked to make Fifty Shades of Grey a massively popular success, selling 70 million copies in its first year, and leading to two sequel books that explore the theme of, hey, remember how Christian Grey, like a vampire, was turned into a BDSM person because when they were a teenager, they were BDSM'd by one of their mother's friends? <laughs> Bet you thought there was no way we could amplify the creepiness of Twilight, but here we fucking are. 
And what if we showcase that having a wife and kids can tame this wild BDSM man, whose BDSM is used as a way to distance themselves from getting close to people, and that they are cured by traditional Christian marriage and domestication. Some great stuff. And the films that came out as well are pretty much the perfect adaptation, possibly the best adaptation ever made because the dialogue is a mixture of cringe, boring and unbelievably stilted and the plot doesn't fucking go anywhere. Seriously, I made my flat rewatch Fifty Shades of Grey with me and we spent the entire time having me telling them that something interesting or funny was totally just about to happen at some point but one of them left and the other fell asleep on the couch. So that should tell you how successful that was. Every single criticism that one can have with Twilight is amplified through the lens of a fan clearly gutting the franchise and then poorly crafting their own self-insert sexual fantasy based off of its premise and the copycat elements that you can sense in E.L. James' writing go beyond just that. We also have the additional elements that she's released, such as Grey and Darker, a retelling of the book series from the perspective of Christian Grey rather than Anastasia Steele, which is unbelievably funny that she can just keep getting away with ripping Maya off so blatantly, and is also completely unnecessary because there is nothing added in there that we don't already know about. Midnight Sun at least gave us a view of the vampirism and the vampire family that we didn't really obtain from the original series. Grey and Darker is just pretty much the same thing, but the main character is different. And none of this is inherently bad, like I said. Fan fiction is fine. It's a great way for an audience to engage and to get their thoughts out. And I mean shit. My own version of that is writing stupidly long video essays, so I'm not going to throw rocks in this glass house we've built together. But when it is transformed into a global phenomenon that utilizes its inspiration as a way of bumping up its own success, to try and target the same audiences, or to caption itself as Twilight but darker and older and sexier, then it's not fan fiction anymore. It's a bad ripoff. And the reason I wanted to bring all this up was because I do think that Fifty Shades of Grey's very existence has reflected poorly on Twilight. I think that its heavy association between the two has led to a far more critical and aggressive viewing of Twilight's themes, as they become interpreted in Fifty Shades of Grey in a way that is far more shitty, and that I think also led to people acting as if the writing in Twilight is worse because of what it led to and it inspired. The truth is that Fifty Shades makes Twilight look like a goddamn literary masterpiece, and the only thing that we should be using Fifty Shades for is understanding the way that audiences relate to that series, and with older women apparently it's encouraging them to explore their sexual fantasies and prose more. A time-honoured tradition that, hey, if that's the best way for you to get it out there because you can't get it in your real life, then more power to you. But that's enough about this franchise, because I don't want to say any more about it, and I don't really have much more to say. And I'm in charge here, if I don't want to talk about it, I, I don't have to, you, you can't make me. And wow, would you look at that, the script is saying that I need to move to doing a proper conclusion now, something that I can't believe has come so quickly, and yet here we are. Feels kind of nice to be able to do a short video for once, you know? It's like a breath of fresh air. I'm like, oh, this didn't take, you know, 12 hours to record. So, I already did a kind of little fake conclusion before I surprised you with the whole Fifty Shades chapter. And that honestly covered most of what I wanted to say. I do believe that Twilight is a terrible franchise that has characters who are difficult to pass and whose development and themes often don't feel like they make sense or that they're going anywhere. It's also clear that Maya's gutting of vampires into this weird religious interpretation, a weird religious ideology that is present throughout, but especially in some of the worst entries like Breaking Dawn's first part, 
and leads to certain stories that are uncomfortable to say the least for people who do not belong to that Mormon audience is something that has led to its mockery intensifying over the years. And with nostalgia and a twilight resurgence on the rise, probably, that's just going to get worse. It's also led to people reconsidering the racial and gender themes that are present, and noticing attitudes that reflect a very traditional and conservative viewpoint on those, inspired by a religious organisation that has those values at its foundation and core. Alongside this, the way that an indigenous tribe is poorly filtered, researched and appropriated to fit the supernatural narrative around them, and that has become more dominant than the actual heritage of that very real group of people, is a very shitty thing that seems to keep happening with these authors. Like, get their input on it and do the bare minimum of respect, holy shit. All of this is true. All of this is a fact to the reality of Twilight as a franchise, and it's something that we need to come to terms with, and to realise what that means for something that became a dominant piece of our popular culture for years, and is still so dominant that most people will know of its existence even if they haven't seen it, and could tell you elements about it. We need to recognise what Twilight's success means for us. That it does mean that a terrible series, one that is hurtful to groups of people and who is based on very lazy research, can get picked up and can blow up because we, and I am speaking to the other fans at this point, love that shit. We love it, regardless of its quality or the impact that it has, and much like the love in Twilight itself, the worst thing we can do is not be critical of this toxic relationship. We need to analyse, and we need to think about it, and we need to be aware that it's okay to demand better from future writers and to seek out improvements on it. Just because we love it doesn't mean we have to be okay with it mauling our face or turning us into a vampire like it. That metaphor doesn't hold up as well as I hoped, but you, you get what I mean. Twilight as a franchise is a reflection not just on Maya and her beliefs, but on us, the people who consumed it. And it's always a good time to think about why you like something, and whether your liking of it is a legitimate love based on a real connection, or whether it's because it utilised cheap tricks and easy elements to appeal to you personally at a time period in your life when you were more susceptible to that. It's a racist, sexist nightmare fueled by an author and their religious beliefs, and lack of effort put into involving outside voices, and that has continued throughout the series, and even into its fanfic Copycat 2, which failed to be critical enough to change those kind of themes. And that means that any love of the franchise needs to come to terms with those facts, and what those facts mean. So, there you have it. Twilight is a series that existed, and did stuff, and means stuff to a lot of people, and maybe the stuff it means is bad stuff, and the writer is bad, but it's also stuff that means good stuff to others, so yeah. I, I don't know what you expected from this conclusion, really. These brief looks are always more about what you can take away from the long-form experience than finding a singular defining answer to a franchise, and I'm sure that whatever point you got from all of this is as valid as whatever I got. Now, if you liked what I did here, and want to see me do more brief looks, I will. But liking, sharing, commenting, and creating fanfics of this video essay to post online, and ultimately surpass it, are the best ways to ensure that I feel more encouraged to keep doing that. And an even better way to make sure that I keep doing brief looks and that you keep being able to watch them, is going to my Patreon or Ko-Fi and financially supporting me. Because I need money to be able to live as I have not had the ability to live for hundreds of years and create my own generational wealth like those rich fucking vampires. Bloody bourgeoisie bloodsuckers, am I right? If you do, you get to have your name scroll across my screen while I say nice things about you. All of these people are really cool. They're awesome and amazing, and they're doing something that really helps me. And each one haunts me at night when I think about how to best justify their continual payments towards my random pop culture ramblings. I could not do what I do without them, and that means the world to me, while also terrifying me. Hopefully, you got what you came for from this video, and if you did, 
that is fantastic and all that I can ask for. Otherwise, thank you for watching this video, and I hope you have a great day. There's not... The last video had like a fake out ending because I was doing like a... I need to stretch it to 10 hours. This one's not doing that, so... At this point, you're sticking around to see unedited me just talking to the camera. So if that's what you wanted, then I guess you got it. It took, you know, like five, six hours to get to it. So not the most efficient use of your time, but... Hey, whatever, whatever does you, am I right? Bye.